Welcome, dear listeners. I'm Jonathan Carlin. Oh, and I'm Ben Carlin. <laughs> and we... <laughs> I forgot I had a part. <laughs> you do. <laughs> and we invite you to join us through the Gryffindor, your one-way ticket to the enchanting world of Harry Potter. So grab your wands, dust off your broomsticks, and join us as we unlock the secrets behind Philosopher's Stone Chapter 7, The Sorting Hat. I, I, I gotta say, I feel like, because we started just right in chaotic, uh, yeah. but, mm-hmm. but I feel like it's very fitting because the chapter art for The Sorting Hat Yeah, is, let's talk about that one just immediately. Because it is remarkably not the hat it is it is yeah i wrote down i literally like before i even finished chapter six i looked over and was like what the what is this what the what i wrote terrible art to chapter name all it's like one yeah the chapter art in case you're wondering depicts peeves holding the walking sticks looking all angry and floating up in the air but like one the chapter is called the sorting hat and the sorting hat and the act of being sorted into Gryffindor for Harry is one of the most significant moments in all of wizarding history not just like in this book like of the end this is a huge monumental moment so that the chapter art is not the hat or Harry wearing the hat like it is terrible and then not only that on top of that the picture of peeves is also a terrible picture of peeves yeah it's like he's not even like funny it, yeah right i know like he's he's not nearly like whimsical enough like he just seems like actually like like a mean creature right and, and that's not how peeves is so, right um, he, he should look like everything is a joke yes absolutely yeah. absolutely so we'll we'll come back to to i i can go deep into peeves uh you know as as we get closer i know to you the, can the the poltergeist uh, yes lore there but um no so this was this was like one of those things where i did write peeves uh, you know, who is also famously like le- uh, you know, not in the films. Um, At I think all. probably just like one of those things that was just like too hard to incorporate as like an additional detail. But either which way, I feel like the, the sorting hat is highly depictable. It feels like there's really no excuse. Like I know a lot of times it's like there's a little bit of caution um, being added towards the chapter art, like not being too much of like a giveaway, but like quite literally it's the, called the sorting. It's hat. called the sorting hat. It's yeah. like it's like even though in this chapter, like we will be mildly more informed than the characters themselves about how the sorting is going to go down like we already know it's going to be a hat so anyway just show us just show us the hat the hat show is us the hat. It's such a cool thing so anyway um but that being said i felt like there was no way to not talk about it first things first yeah as yeah. we enter this chapter although um, i will say then before we dive too far in that i have some other um some i know last time uh, last week we were number one on the books podcast in sweden if you recall oh yeah yeah shout out to yeah. sweden yeah what up sweden <laughs> well, I was looking through the charts today, and we are we are presently number three in Sweden. So oh. there is that. However, Ben, we are number one in books in Lebanon. Lebanon, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps you've heard of us. We're kind of a big deal in Lebanon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this would be like the new running gag for the show. It's just like, wh- which which country are we the number one on books in this yeah. this week? We're number three. In America, okay, so that's pretty good. I'll take that. I mean, yeah, way to go to all of our listeners out there. I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I am just proud of our audience for boosting through the Gryffindor to the number three book slot. It's pretty cool. It's pretty a, cool. Just, just a little United bit of a sophomore States. slump for for Sweden. That's all. You know, they'll be back. They'll be, look, if you're in sweet, if you're a Swedish listener, just go through right now. Just you know, give it a rating, give it a review. Maybe we'll read it next time. Make sure you include "I'm from Sweden" in your <laughs> review, and that I I promise you, if there is any rev- if there's a variety, I'll pick one of them. But if there's not, I'll still pick the "I'm from Sweden" one. Okay. So okay. there you go. There we go. Yeah, All right, perfect. we'll get to the review later. Anyway, let's talk about the the chapter itself. Yes. The sorting out where yeah, mainly what happens is this the the first years arrive. Into the great hall, and they go through the sorting ceremony, and that that is uh, the most. We are introduced to um, Snape for the first time from afar. Although the next chapter is called the Potions Master, so we're going to get a full on introduction there. And uh, Harry sees Dumbledore for the first time, and uh, yeah, that's that's the gist of what happens in this chapter. But there is still a lot to unpack. Oh my gosh, yeah, it's it's just like endless amounts and, and lots of like really cool like I think ideas and stuff. But yeah. kind of first and foremost. Um, like so we can kind of get the ball rolling here is the fact that um, of all people both Ron and Hermione are both unaware of what the sorting ceremony actually entails it is very unusual 
that yes, no one, even Malfoy doesn't seem like he knows how the sorting is going to go. Yes. And so like you get like a little bit of like in a like like a um, a suggestion from Ron sort of on behalf of Fred and George uh, where where Ron says the line like some sort of test. I think Fred said it hurts a lot, but I think he was joking. And like, you know, when you know the Weasleys and then like even like especially the more you get to know the Weasleys, it wouldn't surprise you in the slightest that Fred and George were just trying to like mess with Ron. Yeah. But then like in addition to that, like, you know, Hermione knows that like that the, the ceiling of the Great Hall is enchanted because she read about it in Hogwarts of history. And it's like, how on earth is it possible that Hogwarts of history does not make reference to the sorting hat? Right. Like it, that it really does not track, but Hermione doesn't know how it's going to go either because it says Hermione Granger was whispering very fast, but all the spells she'd learned and wondering which one she'd need. And it's like, you're right. It's like, there's, there is no way that Hermione doesn't know. And there's no way that Hogwarts of history doesn't, list th- doesn't mention the sorting hat and like like i mean sure maybe fred and george were messing with ron but like the, the they're not his only older brothers you know he's the sixth weasley to be going there's no way the sorting hat has not come up in his life well so this is this is like where i always think it's kind of interesting because i feel like there's a decent possibility that the sorting hat is quite literally under like its own fidelius charm yeah, oh yeah the, i and mean this the, i subscribe to that theory so hard yes absolutely yeah. because there 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 is this sort of like really really unusual like um, nature about how the fact that the sorting hat is never ever discussed with uh, incoming students prior to their sorting, which means that like as students, you are supposed to come in, enter the sorting, and it's like a piece of information that you can know but not share, um, right. I think is what it comes down to. It's like until the hat, it, it, like the way the Fidelius charm would work in this scenario is very similar to like how it's concealed within Grimald place right. where Dumbledore is the secret keeper of the headquarters of the Order of the Phoenix, which in book five is Grimald number 12 Grimald place. Right. Whilst Dumbledore is alive, he has to tell each individual person the secret of where it is. And then those people know the information, but they can't tell anybody else about it. Right. So that's how the hat would have to work. The it seems like the hat is under a Fidelius charm where like it itself is is the one who has to tell you the secret of itself. Yeah, either that or somehow it's like a like a pass from headmaster to headmaster type of Well, but it's not Dumbledore who tells them about it. Like it is and, and I don't think McGonagall says um tells them about the hat ahead of time either. She just like puts the hat on the stool and then the hat begins to sing. She doesn't like give them instructions like everyone's going to put on the hat next right she even says like yeah. uh, like before they enter the great hall it says the sorting ceremony will take place in a few minutes in front of the rest of the school i suggest you all smarten yourselves up as much as you can while you are waiting yeah um which if anything almost seems to further suggest that like this is the type of thing where you're about to need to like place put put on some kind of a, a performance or or put your skills on right display yeah um, and then leading up to it it says harry quickly looked down again professor mcgonagall as Professor McGonagall silently placed a four-legged stool in front of the first years. On top of the stool, she put a pointed wizard's hat. The hat was patched and frayed and extremely dirty. And like no one says anything else, the hat just begins singing. So it seems like the way it's working is that no, no one can tell you about the hat. The hat must tell you about the hat. But I think that this is so vital. I mean, even if you were the founders devising this exact concept, because you don't want students coming into school with like, I mean, they may know like which house that they that they like would prefer or something right. like that. They might know the houses their parents were in, but like they don't know how to prepare for what sorting will be like. And, right. And therefore it's sort of like you don't like you'll know for for 35 seconds prior to your moment what's about to happen. Uh, the the interesting exclusion to this where we do eventually get a commentary about the hat prior to sorting is when Harry in the epilogue in the yeah. epilogue. So literally we're going from, you know, chapter seven of book one to not even the last chapter of the series, but the epilogue of the series where Harry is talking to his son, um, Albus Albus and basically says like the sorting hat takes into consideration like what you want or at least it did for me um, and what's interesting about this is that like normally with the Fidelius charm and Dumbledore for example in Grimmauld Place is that upon Dumbledore's death everybody who then had been told the location would now 
be able to share the location because they would become new secret keepers right. themselves, which dilutes the power of the Fidelius charm. Um, and but I think like what happens it, at the Battle of Hogwarts is Voldemort summons the sorting, the sorting hat. hat from the headmaster's office, which he then plants on top of Neville's head and then lights it on fire. Right. So what like the the way the theory would go is that when he does this, he effectively kills the sorting hat. Yes. And, and like every, destroys the Fidelius charm. Well, it destroys it to the tune of now everybody who knows about the sorting hat is now, a secret keeper. Is now a secret keeper. Right. Meaning anybody who has ever been sorted before is now capable of talking about right. it. Right. So yeah. conceivably if this if it's still true, Harry could tell Albus about the sorting hat. Hat, but then Albus could not tell other people. That is possible. Until yeah. he has been sorted, I guess. Right? M- d- Maybe? D- depending on how they revive the sorting hat after the fact, right. I think would be the answer to that question. Right. You're right. Yeah. Okay. I don't know how it would go from there. But the point is, there is a loophole wherein Harry should be able to tell Albus about the sorting hat because Voldemort destroys the the initial Fidelius charm. Yes. 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 So but prior to that is like the only explanation to me for why it's not in Hogwarts of history and why Ron himself doesn't know about it. Right. Yeah. Because I mean, Ron would literally be what, you know, he's got one, two, three, four, five, five brothers ahead of him and yeah. two parents, all of whom who have been through the sorted. ceremony. It's like, it's like, this is never come up around the dinner table before at any point in time. Like, um, but what I love about that though, is that there's like a completely in universe explanation. That's also kind of cool. Yeah, you it know? is. Very so cool. it's, it's like, it's like you can look at this as sort of like a loophole or a plot hole or something like that. Uh, but instead I think it's just like, you just got to find the clever explanation. And, and in my mind, that's, that's my own personal. Oh yeah, and absolutely. So, absolutely. Uh, I think that's pretty fun. And we know that the Fidelis charm can be broken by powerful spells because that's exactly what happens to the Potter's house, which ironically, also by Voldemort. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, yep. So that's that's exactly right. The, the other kind of interesting thing here that I that I found is like another one of those a um, little bit of like an interesting inconsistency is the stool itself. Um, I think that in Prisoner of Azkaban and I, I went through and I was trying to fact check this a little bit and it seems like things have also been like edited throughout the years. But I think when Flitwick brings out the, the stool for the sorting ceremony in Prisoner, it's a three legged stool or oh. it has once been described as a three-legged stool and it's since been corrected to be a four-legged stool but this is kind of funny because i am absolutely certain that in j versus ben trivia before we have had the question before how many yeah. how like how many legs are on the stool and it basically is like it pretty much has to be three or four yeah um so I, that's kind of like one of those things where it's like was that like an inconsistency that was like covered up is there any like other reason about a three-legged stool that like like it wouldn't be the correct kind of stool or I, th- I think the the reason like if you wanted to back i don't know so are, are we are you saying that it, it did say three in here it, it's it, it uh, has been see. corrected. If you go to the the latest copy of Prisoner of Azkaban, it's okay. a, it says four in here and it says four now in Prisoner of Azkaban. But there are reports online that at one point in time, Prisoner described a three legged stool. Oh, OK. That seems backwards. I can see I could have argued towards like it being a three legged stool here and have been a four legged stool in Prisoner. Because solely because the three legged stool could then represent Gryffindor, Ravenclaw, and Hufflepuff. Okay. And like would omit the and would be three legged because Slytherin had split from the school. And okay. then after Chamber of Secrets, the like the Chamber of Secrets like lore would have been resolved, at which point the stool the stool could have four legs again because like the school would no longer be That's split cool. by that particular mystery, which was what happened upon Slytherin splitting from the school. Pretty but cool. apparently it's backwards, so I don't think that actually tracks. <laughs> I don't know. No, that's very interesting. But while you're on that exact note, I think it's a perfect time to jump just a little bit ahead and we can always jump back. Yeah. Um, there is, of course, the opening uh, feast uh, sentiment from uh, Mr. Albus Dumbledore and, and it, it feels like pure chaos, but I'm going to let you explain it. So the, the famous line is uh, nitwit blubber oddment tweak. Yes. So he says his complete nonsense words and Harry and everyone applauds and Harry's like, what What was that about? Is, is, is he mad? And he asks Percy the prefect and I love that he's continuously listed as Percy the prefect. Um, we made a video about these this random line of dialogue once upon a time about like what what on earth does he mean here? And our ex- our own explanation is that um, each word nitwit blubber oddment and tweak are all meant to be uh, represent the opposing ideals of each house. So, for example, 
a, a nitwit would be like the opposite of Ravenclaw. Yeah, like the, like like where a, where a nitwit might suggest like lacking in intelligence or, right. or, or smarts. Um, so then Blubber, we said was this. I went back and reread our own script, so I that's sort of where I'm going from here. But we said Blubber would uh, represent the opposite of a Gryffindor, um, meaning someone who is maybe like uh, Blubber just means fat. So that's perhaps like the a word eleven year old might use to put down someone who is like less athletic. Which, if you're in Gryffindor, they are like a little bit more bold and daring. So it's like um, athle- <clears throat> athletics might be something they would take very seriously. And by might, I mean there actually is a line from Snape where he tells Harry that if his Quidditch team loses, it'll be the first time Gryffindor finished at the bottom of the table in 200 years. So like it is definitely a house that takes athletics seriously because that means Gryffindor has never finished less than third in a four team contest in two centuries in two centuries. Yeah, and there, there's additionally like the uh, like the layer will we get from um, nearly headless Nick that uh, Slytherin has won the house cup for how many years in a row now? It is six years in a row six years in a row, but yeah. I, I think that the it's interesting to to note that I think it's it's they have not won the house or they've won the house cup six years running, but I think that at least while Charlie Weasley was on the oh um, on the Gryffindor Quidditch, Gryffindor team. Quidditch yeah. team, it means that Gryffindor has won the Quidditch Cup more recently, more recently than the House Cup. Although yeah. I guess they're there, I, I would suspect that usually who wins the Quidditch Cup also wins the House Cup, but it's not always. Right, a yeah, mirror. Okay. That's that's true. That's yeah. true. Um, um, next up, we said that I, I I almost disagree with our past selves here. We said odd meant uh, it means a remnant part of something like left over from a larger piece or set, uh, which is no longer useful. So like if you had like a large piece of cloth and all that was left for a few scraps that would not that weren't really functional or anything. Those would be the oddments. So our argument in our video was that an oddment would be the opposite of Slytherin who as far as the books or Dumbledore go would view uh, the Slytherins as really valuing pure bloodedness. So i.e. if you're like a half blood or any fraction of magicalness that isn't 100% you are an oddment and not worthy of magical education. But I would almost think you could also argue oddment for Hufflepuff because she like she took the rest like took the the oddments oh i yeah <laughs> you know? i, I kind of see what you mean yeah like i mean that's that's sort of like the the entire mantra of of hufflepuff of of hufflepuff house yeah. is that they're just sort of like the like open armed you know the, like group it's sort of like everybody's welcome here right um yeah. So. Um, but so then otherwise, uh, then Tweak, of course, would be left for Hufflepuff, at least in our initial video. Um, so Hufflepuffs are like loyal and hardworking and humble and down to earth. So from their point of view, they may think the value placed on things like courage or wit or cunning by the other three houses were a little excessive and needs to be tweaked. Tweaked. Okay. So interesting. Um, but then the point of it as often is the case with Dumbledore is that like it's not about like the difference or differences between the houses the 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 school functions best when the houses are all like supporting one another and it's more of like a, a unified thing so the idea would be that look 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 at these funny look these are words that anyone in your house might use to describe the members of the other houses. Sure. So like if you're in Gryffindor, you might call the Ravenclaws nitwits as like an insult or something like, like a way to like needle them specifically. Right. That, supposedly that would be the way to like to, to get through to them or something. Yeah. Right. Like, but the point is that Dumbledore is trying to make at least according, you know, <laughs> the uh, uh, my our theory is that um, he's saying these things is like, look, the irony is that the all of you might think of these words to describe the other houses, and yet you're all doing it because you're all actually the same. Ah, uh, yes, right. Yes, I love it. I yeah. love it. And and it's another one of these things where, like, I feel like uh, Dumbledore sort of has this like kind of constant air of whimsy. I feel like it hails back to the fact that he, you know, again uses like candy as like his um, passwords for all mm-hmm. of his, you know, to to get into you know his office and stuff like that. Like it it comes across as like a little bit of like silliness which i think we see even more of uh you know further on in the chapter when they sing the school song and oh, yeah you know like it's like one of these things where like dumbledore almost seems to like, be like at your own pace yeah. which is like usually not the way that you sing songs oh it's, yeah it's like at the rhythm that the song is supposed to be sung and then of yeah. course you know fred and george just fully lean into um you the know, funeral march the funeral yeah. march yeah <laughs> which you know they're just going like a like a painfully slow i know i um, wrote like a little note next to the song which i don't think ever comes up again like in any of the other opening feast it's not like all right and now it's time to sing the song or anything like that 
But um, my note is that my head canon is that I like to think that uh, Godric and Salazar are the ones who wrote the lyrics to the song together. Okay. And like they just kept coming up with like, because it's very silly. And I like to think that they were just coming up with like silly things like we need a school song. And Helga and Rowena were over there like you guys, you, I, I don't like it. They're like, no, 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 no. Get, get, here's the fun part. Here's the fun part, guys. You can sing it to any tune, any tune at all. That's right. the fun part. That's what makes it so whimsical. And they're like, got, okay, well, <sighs> This goes back to like our, our favorite headcanon, which is just simply that uh, the friendship between Godric and Sal, as we always like to call yeah, them, Sal, as Sal um, is is nothing but like jovial, and and it's like the friendship everybody has always wanted. It's like like fully founded on mutual respect and humor and talent and like exactly. regard and respect, and it's like so the idea in, in an which minds, is what the Sorting Hat says. It says like Salazar and like we're it. it asks of the school were there ever better friends than Gryffindor and Slytherin unless it was the other two of Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff right right yeah and even the fact that um, there there's the line in the original song from the sorting hat that says uh, or yet in wise old Ravenclaw which which I was like you know it's kind of interesting to me that it regards Ravenclaw as wise and old which I mean you you would assume on some level that these were <coughs> some of the most powerful witches and wizards of, of ever uh, so they probably lived like nice long lives and stuff like that um, but for for Ravenclaw to receive those those accolades specifically of wise and old um, makes me feel like there's a decent possibility that Ravenclaw is like a fair bit older than the other founders mm, as, possible. as their founding. Right. Um, which, which I, I, I don't know if I have anything like really interesting in terms of or, like, or just more because the way the sorting hat was formed was that Gryffindor took the hat off his head, which I like to think all the founders made fun of him for because oh, no, it's very but, silly looking. No, but he, but he like <laughs> sported it and he's like, it's totally yeah. working. <laughs> I, here, my head cannon is that he came back from like a, from like a farmer's market type village shop one day and is sporting the hat and is like guys guys what do you think what do you think and they all look at him and just immediately begin making fun of him and he's like i'm keeping it yeah, oh, yeah absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and then it goes on to be the sorting cat which is fantastic so if anyone wants uh you know me and ben to write a founder series one day we're open to it and i have a million ideas about how it would go but in any case um Wise old Ravenclaw, the way so eventually they need a way to sort the the students in the houses after they are gone. So Gryffindor takes the sorting hat off of his head and they each put a little bit of themselves in there. So to me, this is just more of like um, th them just like teasing one another. It's like like I can I can imagine even if they're all like in their mid 20s or something that they just they always refer to like Rowena is like, oh, why is old Ravenclaw over there? Oh, yeah, yeah that, I <laughs> can know? see that too. It, yeah, it, like, like really bothers her because she's so prim and proper. Right, yeah. <laughs> right, right. right. I, like, like it's almost like she's not actually older at all. It's just, right. it's just like her innate maturity. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> mm. Yeah, being classic Sal and Godric. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. totally using it. Oh, against, my gosh. Yeah. So, such fun. Such jokesters. <laughs> such jokesters. Um, no, so I love that. Um, it, going back to, again, the, the Sorting Hats original song, though, there's a couple, there's, there's a couple of lines that are, that are pretty just you know great in here but yes. the uh, the one that stood out to me this time around was um like uh, it says oh you may not think i'm pretty but don't judge on what you see i'll eat myself if you can find a smarter hat than me uh the i'll eat myself is a really funny reference to just like like uh like a um sort of slang throwaway term it's like like i'll eat my hat oh you yes. know and it's like it's like he like the sorting hat is basically saying like i'll eat myself because i can't eat my hat because i am a hat oh um, i also like when he says for i'm the hogwarts sorting hat and I can cap them all and it's like he's making a hat pun <laughs> yeah <laughs> he the hat is making a hat pun about capping people that's hilarious um, I also uh, what I appreciate about the opening song is that despite it's it, this is I think very cleverly done is that despite all of the negativity you've heard about Slytherin going in it the hat itself does not give Slytherin like a negative spin spin yeah he just says you'll make your real friends those cunning folks use any means to achieve their ends and it's like you could interpret that but it's like for all intents and purposes that that's just like you know oh yeah these these people get stuff done um but but now i don't know if you ever do this whenever i read this particular phrasing it's like i always feel like the word bitter has been left out like these cunning folks use any means to achieve their bitter ends. Like, I don't know. I don't know why my brain always fills that in. 
Do you ever fill that in? I have never filled that in in my head before, but I, I can I can I can absolutely see like where you're coming from, right? Is because that like is that a phrase like to achieve is like bitter is that part of like a phrase to the, I mean like the like the phrase like to the bitter end it, you know is yeah. sort of like like and and you know and, and they held out till the bitter end it you know like it, it feels to me like the way it's worded is meant to leave the word bitter hanging in the air like oh you thought we were gonna say that but I made it a little more fair sure and it's like no but you but but actually it is more negative because it's Slytherin. <laughs> So, so do you think that the, that the the sorting hat is sort of like letting the audience itself sort of like interpret what it's left out? Like it's like it's yes. it's like I'm not gonna be like actively anti Slytherin in my in my my spiel here. Um, I do think it's interesting that Slytherin um, comes last both in in the song and also when Professor McGonagall is listing off the various houses. Uh, four houses are called Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and Slytherin. So, like, she does even lead with her own house, which is Gryffindor. she does. That's actually the same order the hat goes in. Okay, okay. As well. so, yeah. So maybe that's maybe that's uh, it, it's also alphabetical, is it? It not? is. Yeah. So maybe that's part of it. Yeah. yeah. Who taking, knows? Taking Who things. knows? Okay. Interpret it what you will. There. Um, yeah. Anyway, I don't have too much more to say about the song itself but then we do get into the the sorting where you get introduced to just a myriad of students some of whom go on to uh, show up as like Harry's friends or classmates later on some of whom like Brocklehurst Mandy never hear from them again yeah I know, you know? It, it, it's um, yeah so you've got like like Millicent Bulstrode who who comes up just all the time and always Lavender Brown but yeah you're right uh, there's there's another character who I think um, I was reading I'm trying to find what their name is now because of course it is like actively forgettable um i think it's sally ann perks maybe um is is like one of the names that's listed and i think later in book five when they're like reading off names to like step forth for your uh like owl's examinations you get like a lot of throwbacks to these early names but like this is one of the ones that's just like left off which so, one? Uh, I think it's Sally Ann Perks. Sally Ann Perks. Did I, did I miss that reading through just now? Uh, let's see here. Yeah, it's after Patil and Patil and then oh. Perks, Sally Ann. Oh, Sally Ann Perks. Wow, you're right. There it is again. What a forgettable name. Um, there's a f- yeah, man. There's yeah, there's there's a bunch of other interesting things that I feel like happened during the the sorting. Uh, Seamus Finnegan, for example, is like someone who is is like one of the only ones that gets like a uh like well it, Neville does too, but um. Seamus specifically has like a little bit of like a pause. Yeah. Um, and what, what's interesting about that is Seamus is the one sorted directly before <coughs> Hermione, who quite literally we know through like Pottermore reading is a hat stall. Yeah. So it's like it literally says like Finnegan Seamus, the sandy haired boy next to Harry uh, in line, sat on the stool for almost a whole minute before the hat declared him a Gryffindor and then Granger Hermione. And it's just like, you know, the hat hat went on her yeah. head Gryffindor. I know like, it's like the, it, it. This is definitely like a retcon thing where it's like, oh, mm, Hermione. Definitely. That one was more important. <laughs> but, but like where else would you have even put like Seamus? Like I don't I, like it doesn't seem like he in the same way as like some of the others have like an obvious like like you could say like Ron and Hufflepuff Hermione and Ravenclaw like, you know, Neville and Neville and Hufflepuff or whatever like but this this is not one where oh, I like, know like Seamus is always like embodied. I know I like I underlined almost a whole minute and wrote down like I wonder what the debate was between I know. Oh, yeah, like I, the only thing that really stands out to me is that later on in book five, when the ministry is like attacking Harry, Seamus is like the the Gryffindor boy who's kind of against Harry that year, like clinging more to like his his mom's beliefs that the ministry is correct. Um, and I don't know what where that would place Seamus otherwise than though, like what what that attitude might represent, like possibly like he's just like more loyal to his family so maybe like Hufflepuff or something or maybe just like all the Slytherins are against Harry so maybe Slytherin it doesn't seem like there I don't have any arguments for Ravenclaw yeah it doesn't it doesn't seem like he's ever been like described as 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 like being like a like a super student or something like that he almost seems more like a little bit of like a like a class clown jokester type yeah Um, I mean like the the attitude he displays when he isn't aligning with Harry is like maybe more similar to like Zachariah Smith 
Yeah, um, who is in Hufflepuff? Right, that's a good point. That's um, a good point. I guess so, it could be that one. But this, but. I mean, this just goes to show as well that like your, you know, your sorting doesn't always like like perfectly indicate you know necessarily what your what your characteristics will be like. So yeah, um, there there is that. But yeah, so then Hermione of course does get sorted, and and it does feel like there's just like a bit of like a, a quick oversight that she would be like a candidate for Ravenclaw, and they're like with you know just like being extremely studious and and valuing like intelligence and wanting to excel. Yeah, uh, particularly like with grades and stuff like that. Um, then we do get Neville, uh, who it does give us like uh, just the phrase the hat took a long time to decide with Neville when it finally shouted Gryffindor. Um, you know, so that's that's sort of like you know we we do we do know why yeah that and then he gives the hat to uh, Morag McDougal, who never comes up again as far as I'm concerned. I, I yeah I specifically looked up Morag because I was like is this the name of uh, Ara Aragog's. I almost did the thing. You oh, did. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Aragog's wife. Mosag. Mosag. Yeah. Um, but interestingly, Morag is the name of the second most famous, like, lock monster. Um, like, besides the Loch Ness monster? B- besides Nessie. Okay. Morag is the next most highly regarded, like, lock monster. Oh, okay. Like, um, lake monster. Lake monster, yeah. Okay. Um, and so, the like, the the decision for the, the use of the name Morag is, is possibly could be a reference to that's interesting. That, like well, you, the other thing that stood out here and I can never remember this is the is the the surname McDougal because I gosh is I know whenever there like when you learn McGonagall's backstory if you do some like extra reading on Pottermore I can never remember whether she was like engaged to Gregor McDougal or Dougal McGregor it's Dougal McGregor. It's Dougal McGregor. Okay, yeah. never mind. Not important. Not, not related. Not I wrote that. I was like, wait, Gregor McDougal? Was that related? To, is this is this who that did 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 McGonagall's ex flame marry someone else and someone else and produce Morag? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. I know, no. Oh my gosh. Can you imagine? Like, in the, and then it has to be McGonagall who like called them forward. Like, yeah, oh, like yeah. <laughs> McDougal. She's having like a little private battle of, over there. I know. Yeah, and yeah. Then this <laughs> Better ch- not be in Gryffindor. <laughs> I know, but but uh, let's see. But we don't even know where Morag goes. <laughs> yeah, we don't know at all. <laughs> Except, I guess, not Gryffindor. Not Gryffindor. Yeah. Yeah. We know that much. Um, uh, then Moon comes after him, and there's just like a little bit of trivia around uh, Moon, who is also never mentioned again. But. Uh, the, the the character here in Harry's year with the last name Moon that was originally going to be the character of Luna Lovegood. Yes, yeah. Where Luna, of course, is is the Spanish word for Moon. Yeah. Um, you know, and that that is always like one of the interesting ones when like Luna goes on to be such a prominent uh, part of the group as the story unfolds because like everyone else in their lineup, like you meet Ginny, Neville, Harry, Ron, Hermione all right away. Yeah. They're, they're all there the whole time. And then Luna doesn't make her appearance until book five. I know it's, it's like remarkable that which is like, I mean, I would have loved to have been known what Luna was thinking during like chamber of secrets, you know? Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, what's she doing? Cause she's there. Certainly Luna has something to say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, I've in, in chances are, but you know, we, we just made a video a couple weeks ago. Like Luna's always right. Like chances are Luna would have totally like been, been able to be like, oh, it's obvious. It's a basilisk. Isn't it? Yeah. A hundred percent. Basilisks aren't real Luna. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be so funny. Cause if she brought that up, it'd be like, that's a pretty good guess, actually. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense now right. that you say it. Now, yeah, now you say it. Yeah, that's pretty mm-hmm. spot on. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. And, yep. and Luna does seem to have like a bit of a, a bit of a, a knowledge base about Fantastic Beasts, so it seems it seems entirely possible mm-hmm. that she would she actually would have cracked open the otherwise non essential reading Fantastic Beasts and where to find them as as a first year. I know, as a first year, there she is, right there. Yeah. Because is that one of those that's like not in there? What's not in there? The Basilisk. Oh, maybe it's. Ah. Oh man, I can't remember now. My my brain, my brain literally was was like like having a ping pong battle on whether or not I thought it was. I thought it was. God, I am so curious now. I want to know because this is like a weird thing. If you re- that you can like buy the uh, apparent textbook Fantastic Beasts and where to find them, which is published for us mug us muggles apparently. But you're like buying like Newt Scamander's version of it. Yes. Yeah, and like. But what's weird about it is that there are so many animals that, like, even in the movies for the Fantastic Beast movies, you see Newt interact with that are not in the book. Notably, the Zowu is like one of the yeah. really big ones, and then the Manticore, I think, is like a very misrepresented yeah. creature. It's in not there. The, then there's the um, the Swooping Evil, which is like Newt's like little ace monster up his sleeve, like the entire first movie. That's not in there. Or the Chillin. Or um, the Chillin. Yeah, which is yeah. spelled. Q 
Q-I-L-I-N. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The chillin', that's like the little um, horse dragon thing that can tell whether or not you're pure of heart. And it's like, you can see maybe why Newt wouldn't put that in there. Like, he, like within the context of the movie um, Secrets of Dumbledore, the chillin' is this, like, super rare animal that, like, is nearly in danger. There's, like, maybe three in the world or something. Would you describe it as a horse dragon? That is what it... I would describe it as a deer. But when I was recently reading about it for a video, the Wikipedia page listed it as like a cro- as like a half dragon, half horse. Oh, and okay. I was like, I was gonna say I would go with deer like eleven times out oh, of ten. Uh, so would I. So would I. But apparently, that's what it's supposed to look like is half dragon, half horse. Okay. So anyway, um, I can see why Newt, who cares about Fantastic Beasts and their preservation, would not actually list where to find it or tell you anything about the chillin' at all. So I, now I'm wondering though, like if if basilisks are in Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. Then there's almost no reason the entire school isn't immediately on to the fact that it's a basilisk because like even first year should have learned about them. Right. So then it would almost be interesting if it's not in there because it's like that's how they didn't figure it out. That's why they didn't figure it out. This is really your fault. Newt. Newt. Come on, man. Although they literally have the chocolate frog card with Dumbledore on it that has Nicholas Flamel and nobody can think of why the name like rings a bell in the back of their mind. Well, so. that's true too, but like it doesn't just have to be first year. It's surprising to me that Dumbledore can't figure out it's a basilisk, you know, this, is, this <laughs> especially because it has happened. 50, he said 50 years to think about it. Yes. You know, why? Why does a Dumbledore ask Myrtle anything? Yeah, yeah. How has no one asked him, asked Myrtle how she died? It is so also actually also on that exact note in this exact chapter, the same thing happens where they're talking to nearly headless Nick and Seamus asks nearly headless Nick. How did he get covered in blood about the bloody Baron and nearly headless Nick says I've never asked. Are you kidding me, Nick? Are you kidding me? You haven't asked the bloody Baron how he died in the last one thousand years because that's ridiculous if you ask me and honestly if you had asked him then you could have answered this question right here and we might have solved the entire diadem mystery on like day one so I'm blaming nearly had the snick on this one well there you go but you said a thousand years and it, it set me up perfectly because specifically in uh, the book it is written as like we know that we go to um, uh, nearly had the snicks 500th oh, death I'm sorry. Day party you're right the bloody baron though was alive at the same time as Salazar Slytherin. You're correct. So, so the Bloody he's Baron... He's been dead for about 500 years longer. Yes, yeah, so the Bloody Baron's been there twice as long as, yeah. as Nearly Headless Nick. However, in the audiobook, again, this is like one of those, um, like like another like small edit, but the audiobook does say it's been... Uh, he hasn't eaten anything for nearly 400 years, uh, oh, but, but it is edited <laughs> after the fact for nearly 500 years because we know that he was killed in the year 1492 uh, and then 500 year 500 years later would be 1992 which is when the chamber of secrets is opened and also when he has his 500th death day party on Halloween on Halloween I always feel like the fact that it's specifically like 1492 I'm like is there some type of strange like Christopher Columbus exploration related detail. It's like 1492 is just such an obscure date for it to also have like otherwise noteworthiness which right. is you know the year that yeah that nearly the nick was killed yeah in columbus yeah. sailed so and columbus sailed yeah like, what are the odds of that so anyway that's that's just a total brief aside but i always think it's interesting whenever uh because I, I will uh read and listen to the book uh or the chapters before we do our episodes and like when there are those like little um like like isms it's yeah, like corrections oh yeah. <laughs> because obviously jim dale recorded this you know like Oh, yeah, like forever ago. Yeah, for, yeah. so I mean, he recorded it with whatever the original phrasing was. Yeah. So just another small modification That's that, pretty I, funny. that I caught there. Um, let's see here. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Harry sees Professor Quirrell up at the table um, as he's looking down there. And I guess it describes him as he was very looking. He was looking very peculiar in a large purple turban. This is like I made a note. Like, was he not wearing the turban when they met the first time? I guess not. We made this point, I think, actually, because at, at the time that he would have met Harry uh, at the leaky cauldron. Harry shakes his hand, and it's big, like he's wearing the turban to conceal. Yeah, I mean he's wearing the turban now to conceal Voldemort. Right, but Harry shakes his hand, which means that Voldemort wasn't occupying his body at the time of the leaky cauldron. Right. So this was a change. So I actually appreciate this line because it does explain that there that something has happened. Uh, right. Uh, of note in in this like iterum, um, but the the. Um, the, I always thought that this line was was such a like the misdirect between Quirrell and Snape throughout this whole 
book yeah is is so like well played even in the movies that you like you have the scene like where harry like makes you know like eye contact with snape and like quirrell is quite literally like Looking. facing the other way behind yeah. them it's like it's like man like you know you you have to get that detail right because it is so important but it's so easy to not realize what's oh, yeah. actually happening. Oh, it's it's very good. And then the same thing happens at the Quidditch match when like um, Hermione lights Snape's robes on fire. Like it, you can go see Quirrell get knocked down. Yes. And, like, that's actually what does it, which is sneaky. The the thing about this particular scene, it's like it is cleverly done where it's like Quirrell's looking the other way, which so it's actually Voldemort causing his scar to hurt, not Snape. But like what that sort of means is that like for the rest of the year, Quirrell never had his back turned to Harry like in class or anything, you know? Well, he is he is facing the class with a rather large iguana. As uh, we uh, yeah, we all <laughs> seen that one. Of course, of course. Yeah, it, well. it, it is one of those things where, where uh, it is so hilarious to me that in the films when they show Quirrell teaching that he's that he's holding this just comically large iguana because it's just such a like obviously non magical creature. But like, <laughs> like, but why? <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? Why yeah, not? okay. May as well have him holding that iguana. I, I, we got to scoot for it because we just did. Uh, we just did a really fun. We shot a really funny J versus Ben about treats in uh, yes, we the, the Wizarding World, and we had a conversation about this particular treat, which is the peppermint humbugs. Yeah. Um, and notably, uh, it is one of like the items when, when when all the food appears in the Great Hall, which has always been like when I was a kid, I was like, oh my gosh, this would be like so cool and interesting and fascinating. Actually, even on that note, let me pause for like one more second. Um, I have seen a theory before that Nitwit, Blubber, Oddment, and Tweak are names of house elves who the, like prepared oh, the feast. Oh, that's an interesting one. So what Dumbledore is actually doing here is recognizing the the house elves who had contributed to that year's feast. I like that theory too. Because it's literally like it's what he says and then he says thank you and then the feast appears. Um, yeah. So it's it's literally like one of those things where it's like oh that, that's kind of like a fun other explanation otherwise. Um, but this is so funny because I think what we were talking about where were we? Some I think it's in Hagrid's coat. There, it is described that there are peppermint hum humbugs yes. in his coat, and like Harry identifies them as peppermint humbugs. And we were unsure, like, is that like a British thing? Because if it's a magic thing, Harry shouldn't know what they are yet. Yes, and okay. it, it is. We, I, I have, I have looked it up. It is a hard-boiled sweet uh, that is like notable in like a bunch of different countries, but specifically uh, Great Britain. Is, okay, is one where so, so the for some reason a peppermint humbugs is like a, and for some reason. Um, this random candy, yes, this like, muggle candy. Yes, which also uh, comes out with like the main course. Like, so to think of a candy as, oh, yeah. as being something because then dessert pops up. Oh, yeah. Um, Not with the peppermint humbug. So yes. This is one with like peppermint humbugs. It sounds like, oh, whatever you must like it, when I read that, I'm like humbug must be like a word for some sort of a different word for like a, a certain kind of insect in Europe. Oh, and, sure. Yes. And yeah. now there are like peppermint humbugs. Right. How magical. Yeah, like, like chocolate it, frog. <laughs> it, it sounds very like like yeah. whimsical, but but I do know, I mean, like it's not uncommon, you know, like in the same way that people carry gum or mints or something in their pocket. Like I feel like that's probably just like why Hagrid had them. He, he, they were effectively just like mints. Um, so again, just like one of those things where like, you know, as an American where this, the, it didn't immediately mean something, you just sort of assume that it was magical and it's not. Um, so I, I thought that was, I thought that was fascinating yeah. and also fascinating that Harry specifically does not, uh, he grabs one of everything except for the, the peppermints and he's like, never mind that peppermints. <laughs> I don't think so. You know what he does grab Ben potatoes, potatoes, potatoes. I don't know what there is this, this once you notice it, you can't unnotice it. There's just this like running theme that the Gryffindors love of potatoes. So like there's right here. Percy's having some potatoes offers them to Harry and then amongst maybe it's just like magical people like potatoes, which just doesn't seem like a very magical food, but there's all these things showing up on the table and there are boiled potatoes, roast potatoes and fries. So they the, the house elves uh, maybe nitwit blubber oddment and tweak have made <laughs> three different kinds of potato offerings for the students. <laughs> it's like how, how many different yeah, Why? How, how many starches do we need in this dish tonight? It's I like, know it's three enough. Should we go for four? I'm going to fill them up. Fill right. them up. We could throw some baked potatoes in if we want. We could do it. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. just a just a snap of the fingers. Yeah. So then we then we get like, you know, of course, yeah, the introduction to the ghosts, um, yep. you know, throughout this chapter, we do get like a little bit of backstory on three of the four ghosts, but not the gray lady. Yeah, um, which is kind of interesting. Because well, what's interesting is that it describes that there's being like 
like 20 different ghosts or whatever. That's true. Yeah, but then it's like nearly headless Nick definitely describes the bloody Baron as the Slytherin ghost and right. Nick is definitely the Gryffindor like there is like a a a house ghost per house and yet that leaves like 16 other ghosts that are also there that must have gone to Hogwarts because why else would they be haunting Hogwarts and True. yet and if they went to Hogwarts, they were sorted into houses. So why aren't they considered house ghosts? It's it, you know, it's not entirely clear. Maybe not it's just like clear. the um, I think we eventually learned that the Forbidden Forest is like a home to a bunch of magical creatures. So it's like a safe place for them to live. So maybe it's the same with ghosts where it's just sort of like you can flock to Hogwarts and like you're welcome here. But yeah. they still would have gone there. They, they, yes, they probably would have. I guess, but like Myrtle is like in the bathroom and she was in Ravenclaw, but she's not, I mean, she's not the Ravenclaw ghost, but she's a ghost she's, who she's, was in Ravenclaw. She's the ghost of that bathroom. She's the ghost <laughs> of that bathroom, that's for sure, with a mysterious death that no one asks her about, even though there is such an obvious way to figure out who killed her. Yeah. My goodness, what a serious serious oversight it is it is indeed the the other maybe not an oversight but uh the way that neville sort of like sidesteps like everybody's kind of talking about like what their heritage is like so seamus is sort of saying like you know my dad's a muggle mom's a witch you know a bit of a nasty shock for him um you know and then neville uh like is just sort of like well my grand brought me up and then like you know talks about like my great uncle algae and like some other like family members and stuff um great auntie enid um but i, I always think the fact that like the great uncle algae here um like algae is sort of like uh like a a thing that grows yeah. and neville obviously goes on to have um some pretty significant like abilities in the field of herbology and yeah. will eventually teach herbology yeah uh at the school so i feel like it, it's sort of like an interesting like little nod to like something that he will eventually have like talent in right um and i you know for the longest time this is like one of those things i always thought the the great uncle algae and the story of like neville bouncing like in my head this was like additional reading this was like like oh like yeah you know like if you want to read more about neville like you know he didn't show his magical abilities early so like you know w like whatever like you know we can go into the whole the whole history of that um, but no, it's just like right here in the canon. It's a it's a rather large chapter about Neville's backstory, none of which includes anything to do with his parents. Yep. Actually, this is a thing I, I'm surprised that hasn't been like retconned to the tune of the four legs or whatever. But um, when Neville's talking about it, or when they're talking about family, he says, well, my grand brought me up and she's a witch, said Neville. But the family thought I was all muggle for ages. And it's like all muggle is really not the right word for that um, situation. It's like the word is squib right you're right you know there's really no reason that neville the pure blood from the pure blood family wouldn't say the word wouldn't know the word squib, squib. and it, this feels like the um the like dementor. the dementor problem that's yeah. what i wrote down was the dementor problem where it's like um the term squib they don't it like doesn't want to be introduced until filch next year ah uh, yes yeah when when you're actually going to learn it and so until then we'll just say non-magical or all muggle but um yeah, that definitely should be the word squib, but it's like they describe the Dementors as the Azkaban guards right up until Harry meets one, and then they're just called Dementors from there on out because it's like just meant to be a reveal for the audience, I guess. Yeah, that, that's exactly <coughs> what it is. But but you, you did tee me up nicely there with, okay. with your reference to, to good old Argus. Yeah. Mr. Oh, Mr. Filch. So oh, Mr. Filch. He, he is not yet referred to as a squib, and I feel like for good reason because I don't think he's a squib at all. I think he's a poltergeist. Yeah, yeah. This, this has forever been one of like, what, in my personal opinion, I feel like it's like one of the like like just most concrete theories that we've that we've come up with. It just makes sense. It, it does make sense. So basically, like the idea because Filch does not make sense. Filch doesn't. It's like why would you have somebody who is so like non magical existing inside of this castle full of magical calamities, and his job is to solve magical calamities when clearly all of the other professors can quite literally like like the swamp that friend George create. Like Flitwick, I think, cleans it up with like the flick of his wand. Yeah. You know, and like intentionally leaves a portion of it as like a as like a you know a tribute to the twins departure yeah. and stuff like that. Like it's it's this it's a situation where it doesn't even seem like as time goes on, like Dumbledore necessarily like super like respects Filch's ultimate authority inside of the castle. Like, you know, I think he like it's maybe like two books from now or something like that. But Dumbledore will eventually make a reference that's like, you know, you're not to use products from wherever, as I've been reminded by Filch like 392 times or something like that. Um, and it's like 
it's just so interesting because you know Dumbledore is always gracious to everybody. So like you know it seems like he would always respect everything. But um, you know it's just I don't know like everything everything about Filch doesn't make sense. But then his his opposition is always Peeves. And Peeves is a poltergeist that we learn in this chapter. Basically, is like a manifestation of the rule breaking inside of the school. And so like if these two are to be mirrors of one another, then like Filch is almost supposed to be like an aggressive adherence to the, through the rules. rules. Right. So if like if if Peeves, yeah, so the way poltergeists are made in the wizarding world is that if there's too much of one behavior, so like in the example of Hogwarts Castle, there's like so much rule breaking all the time by the students that it has manifested the poltergeist Peeves, which is why he's different from ghosts. Yes. And so he is the literal like embodiment of breaking the rules, which is why no one can control him any yeah. of the time. Right. So conversely, our theory is that Filch is the opposite. He is the manifest- manifestation of all the students that are like aggressively following the rules, like the Percy's or maybe just like the teachers yeah, or yeah, whatever. Absolutely. Yep. And so like there is this sort of like running theme that like we've talked about it on the podcast before that like magical magic is sort of has like a what how we've been describing it has like a um like a quirkiness like a quirkiness yeah. to it like magic is inherently breaking the rules because like muggles can't use magic like the ability to use magic is breaking the rules right and so like by following the rules strictly that is a very non magical thing to do like Dumbledore like sort of quietly like even what you just said where he says like Filch has reminded me three hundred ninety two times not to you know use these products or whatever. It's like, he's telling them that, but at the same time, he's basically like, please go ahead and use them. Uh, right. Like, you know, exactly, like he's like yes. lightly like, encouraging some rule breaking. Like, yes. like, you know, they exist, but he doesn't really mind if students break the rules a little bit. So if Filch then is the poltergeist generated by all of the strict adherence to rules, then he is non magical at all. Right. Yes, right. yeah, exactly. So, and, and maybe therefore, like, you get that squib, um, like, title attached to him. Because he looks so much more like a regular human being, whereas Peeves is, like, floating around doing all kinds of magical wackadoo things. E- exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He's, like, a more of a traditional poltergeist, whereas the kind of poltergeist that Filch is is just, like, so boring. But it's, like, otherwise, he's just, like, why, why, first, why would he want this job where he has to do manual labor for no reason? It's, like, Harry comes in at one point, like, from Quidditch, muddy somehow, and he, like, gets mud all over it, and Filch yells at him, and he's, like, it's an extra few hours of swap you know mopping for me it's like but like it's such a mean job because yeah magically you could just get rid of the mud immediately yeah like Like, there's no reason this job should be held by someone who has to do manual labor no it it, it literally it makes no sense like it's either filter's inclusion at the school is mean or it's like literally a byproduct of the school yeah like they cannot get rid of him yes which seems uh, more likely to me because the other thing is like Filch is like he does not seem to like like kids at all like anytime anyone in Dumbledore's presence brings up the idea of like harming the students it is like the one thing that sets him off oh like, yeah hardcore yeah. Yeah. and yet Filch is constantly like advocating for like whipping and thumb screws and dungeons and it's like yeah you can work here it's fine it's fine it's like it's you can't fine. you can't uh, I know that you can't do any of it yeah like, yeah, like right. you, you will never succeed in the same way that you know they, they also can't really banish uh peeves either you right know, that's that's like you know if you go into the deeper archives of it like you'll know that there have been like attempts to do so and it's like you just can't like it, yeah you just, it, it's like a calamity of the school that has to be there because this is sort of like again the quirkiness of magic exactly yeah. exactly so anyway love 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 that that's always been one of my one of my favorite um you know favorite theories and yes. I, I feel like it holds true and it doesn't harm the narrative at all you know it's not like it changes literally anything yeah. other than like just maybe makes you a bit more comfortable with with why and how Filch is in such an unfair position oh I know Other, uh, also just uh, I, I know we harp on this with some uh, Filch it's like there's so much to say for a character who is not really around much but it's like anytime Harry is out in the castle at night, there's always the threat of running into Filch, which is, you know, it it sounds like, oh, well, yeah, of course, you know, you got to be, you got to have like some threat looming out in the castle, but like Filch is working all day. So why isn't he sleeping at night? Yeah. You know, it's like he's not because he doesn't need to sleep because he's not a real person. There you go. Um, anyway, 
Moving on, um, I love that Dumbledore tell, says that first year should um, note the forbidden force on the grounds is forbidden to all pupils, like and you know unless you have detention, in which case we'll send you right in there, uh, which <laughs> yeah. I think is funny. And then yeah. I also like uh, how Hogwarts is always described as like the safest place, except for you know Gringotts, except maybe Hogwarts or whatever. So safe, and yet even ev- the opening speech, Dumbledore is like, oh yeah, the third floor corridor on the right hand side, bound b- out of bounds, everyone who does not wish to die. <laughs> it's like to die. What do you wait by death? Do you mean like you mean died? It's like, yeah, yeah. Welcome to the safest school in the world. Yeah, it's like you could die. Right, right, right. It's like as long as you follow the rules, you're completely fine. Like did you like magically lock it with some sort of like powerful Dumbledore level spell? It was like I put a padlock on it. You can undo it with magic. You've learned before you got here. Aloha Mora. You know, can, don't worry about it. Can, oh my gosh, you set me up so nicely. Yeah. Can I can, can I get, can I give you a bit of a bit of information and knowledge yeah. <laughs> here? Um, is no, because you're exactly right. Um, Aloha Mora is a term that uh, is specifically taken from, um, and I, I hope I don't butcher <laughs> this explanation, but it's it's a like field of. Um, like fortune telling called uh, geomancy. Oh, um, and it comes from like Madagascar, and there's a whole batch of um, terms that fall underneath of this. Aloha Mora is one of them, which I think is supposed to like roughly translate to like thieves' friend. Um, oh, okay. or, or friendly to thieves, I ah. think is what it's supposed to be. Um, but interestingly, other terms inside of geomancy include Capit Draconis, what? which is going to be the password to get into the Gryffindor common room. It's the first that's, one we ever learned. That's interesting. Other terms include Albus, Rubeus, and Fortuna Major, which is what? also a future Gryffindor password. password yeah. So a whole bunch of words have been borrowed from uh, geomancy, which again is this is this like Madagascar um, version version of fortune telling. Well, that's interesting because I looked up what it, what Caput Draconis was, and it's actually just Latin for dragon's head. It is dragon's head. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And and even in geomancy, that is also what it means. Okay. Um, so you're you're yeah like nail on the head there. But uh, which, which I also that was the reason that I started going down that that. Um, that hole in the first place because I was like dragon's head like you know like what what is this why why would this be the first password like it feels like it's asking to have significance and I mean we know that like like the Kappa Draconis I think is the head of the Draco uh, star constellation um, which okay, that'd be interesting since Draco is a character. Draco is a character. Yeah. Um, like, but head of the dragon. It's like, I, it's like, is, is there some possibility that this is supposed to be like a little like friendly nudge to the Gryffindors? Like, hey, we got to take down those Slytherins. They keep winning the House Cup. Like, right. You know, like, is it like a like? You know, be aware of the head, but of the like dragon. they don't know Draco is going to be the Slytherin. No, they don't. Yeah. yeah, so it's 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 really just kind of like random and odd. Like I don't. I but don't then I guess the what's the um the school motto like never tickle a sleeping dragon. Yes. Right. So then the password is head of the dragon. Yep. Right. So is the is like is like the castle itself like a like a like a metaphor for a dragon. In which case, then the Gryffindors are basically like, yeah, we're the head of the dragon. We're the head. I mean, they are in a and tower. Up at they the top, are in a tower. So. And then if you were to say, like, never tickle a sleeping dragon, that could be like a reference to like Voldemort attacking the school in book seven. Like, look what happens if he damn, okay. you know, yeah. Um, priority incantatum or no, that's, that's the wrong word. What is it? Locomotor. Mm, oh, pure totem locomotor. Yeah. Oh, you mean the yeah, the, yeah. The, the defensive spell? <laughs> I've always wanted to use that spell. One, one of the greatest oh. Maggie Smith Minerva McGonagall moments in in all of so the films, uh, which is saying something because she has so many. Yeah. Um, <laughs> really. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So no, I I thought that that was um, I thought it was very. Uh, you brought up the Aloha Mora, and I was like, oh my gosh, I have so many fun facts about oh, like man. exactly where where this came from. I'm and loving the, the idea of Hogwarts as a dragon. Yeah. Never tickle a sleeping dragon. Yeah. Never tickle. Oh man. Then then it's like, oh boy. Now 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 I'm going like, no, my, sorry, my head is immediately spinning. I'm like, what if the castle is like a transfigured dragon? <laughs> you know. <laughs> Whoa. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. Here we go. All right. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna think about it more. Let me know what you guys think in review form. 
Five stars. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, right. Yeah. Can you? Um, okay, so here now, now my mind is like spinning on like a season finale of our founder series where um, the four founders have found themselves in like the mountains of Scotland, and there is a gigantic dragon. Gigantic, like like huge, massive, massive. But and and it's like it's like the the adversary, but like maybe not like maybe it's not like an evil kind of adversary. It's more like like dangerous um, because because of like some other reason but it's like it's not really like the like the dragon's fault of sorts, right you know right but like so the the end result is sort of like they have this like ha ha hilarious calamity like don't tickle a sleeping dragon like we all know better now don't we but like at least now we're living inside of the halls that was formerly that giant that dragon. was formerly a dragon but yeah. you know this reminds me like because we have the theory that the night bus is like a transfigured zowu yes we do yeah which is like so so that would lend some some credence to like animals could become i mean it's just transfiguration and Animals could become like a like a like a larger physical structure. Well, we or something. I mean, yeah, we even know that like in in uh, transfig- transfiguration class, it's pretty common for them to transfigure um, like objects into animals. Oh, the more I'm thinking about it, the more I'm loving this idea. Just straight up that the castle was a dragon, and and that the Gryffindor common room is the head of the dragon. The Gryffindor common room is the head of the dragon. Oh, there's so many. okay. There's other things you'd have to explain, but I feel like I already work. Okay, listen. All right, let's see. Um, I believe the reason the castle is located where it is is because Rowena Ravenclaw was a seer. Yep. Okay. Right, and she had a dream one night about a um, a boar digging in the ground on top of a cliff. Okay. And then they, when, um, the, which is why it's called hog warts because it's a, a hog that's digging in the ground. And like, that's the location where the castle is built. Okay. So, um, they go there and then apparently when they dig where the hog was digging, that's when they find the pensive, um, which is, I don't know how that fits in with the dragon idea. Now I'm like, is the pensive the brain of the dragon or something? Or, yeah. the, oh, I mean, that would <laughs> be know, really cool. It'd make like, it a very <laughs> singular object. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But like pensives are not necessarily singular things things unless this has happened more times than once right right um, so the other thing okay so what is the description that's given when muggles see hogwarts because it's supposed to is it like smoldering it's supposed to look like ruins yeah does it say smoldering or am i adding smoldering uh, i don't know because it feels like that's a goblet of fire trivia question that's when they're talking about how no one knows where hogwarts is yeah yeah but like that that's like one of those where it's like it's it, smoldering smoldering Smoldering's a little more dragony i know yeah. that's, I, I know it's like, oh like, hold on Okay, I mean, you keep, I'm gonna I'm gonna look up smoldering on my on my ebook version of Goblet of Fire because now I'm really curious. Are we onto something? Are we having a theory mid podcast? Oh my gosh, this I, mean, I can't even tell you guys. This is so frequently how it happens. And I know one of the one of the chief objectives I feel like we had uh, in in doing this particular podcast or the, yeah, do, doing through the Gryffindor was like we're gonna be combing through this book in a way that we've never done it before. Like we've both read it a lot, um, but we've never gone through and like. Re- really examined like every single detail in in the same way that we are this time. So it's it's fun to even like feel it like happening in real time or doing okay. smoldering is used, but it is not a, to describe what the castle looks like to muggles. But I okay. know I know darn darn double darn butts 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 butts. Okay, um, look, I'm just gonna look up ruins and see what the word actually is. Not that it necessarily matters. The matter is, oh, now ruins isn't even used to describe the castle itself at all. So don't worry about that. We'll worry about this later. Um, possible theory. Hogwarts was a dragon. Hogwarts was a dragon. Yeah, yeah. I like it. I like yeah. it. So anyway, yeah, and it, uh, hopefully that was an enjoyable experience watching us like brainstorm in real time. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully if when we make a video about it, it'll be more highly refined than that. Um, that being said, we can we can close off pretty nicely with the chapter because we do get one of Harry's infamous dreams. Yes, um, Harry's dreams are always really, really, really important to the overall story. A lot of times they are telling him things uh, that he like will come to know, needs to know. Like he learns a lot from his dreams. Dreams. In this particular case, it's it's actually not it, that situation. It's because, really just for our benefit. Yeah, this is it, it's a rare occasion where um, the like omniscient uh, narrator. Um, is able to give us a piece of information that Harry himself doesn't know that could be a bit of a tip of the hat, no pun intended, uh, towards what is actually going to happen as this story unfolds. Right. And, and again, it, it's actually quite telling because basically um, 
It, it says perhaps Harry had eaten a bit too much because he had a very strange dream. He was wearing Professor Quirrell's turban, which kept talking to him. That's sort of like a little bit of a yeah, like sorting hat reference. Yeah, um, a little bit. But then it's also just like Voldemort's head underneath the turban. Right, right, yeah. right. But but like I feel like at this point in time, it's sort of like you're just supposed to have like a a swirl of all of the the night's events kind of like racing through Harry's yeah. mind. So it's like, ah, oh, the, the turban. Why not? Like that could be one of the things that's right. That's going on in there. But in reality, like the this is almost his dream telling him like, Hey, you know, there is something inside of Coral's turban that could talk to you. Right. Um, but basically that thing is telling him that he must transfer to Slytherin at once because it was his destiny. This feels like, you know, we talked a little bit about like the, uh, the sorting hat, uh, as it's reviewing Harry's own mind. And I can't believe we actually haven't even really super talked about this that much. Um, but it pretty much provides an accolade to uh, each of the various houses for Harry. So what the sorting hat says when Harry puts it on is difficult, very difficult, plenty of courage, courage. I see not a bad mind either. So those are of course, uh, Gryffindor, Gryffindor and Ravenclaw. And, yep. Respectively there's, there's talent. Oh my goodness. Yes. Which could it, it's, I can't necessarily specifically pin it to Hufflepuff because it seems like all the houses have talent, but because the next one is and a nice thirst to prove yourself. Now that's interesting. That feels like the Slytherin. Nod. Yeah, it feels like the Slytherin. So by like process of elimination, the talent one must be Hufflepuff is what it feels like. Yeah. Kind of feels like when you think about like Cedric, that sort of makes sense too. It definitely does. Yeah, yeah like he he's like just like a highly talented wizard, and and if Cedric is to embody what it means to be a Hufflepuff in like its most like obvious way, then then yeah. I think it's an easy sell for me. Yeah, that that's what that's in regards to. But the big question here is like, is there is part of the reason that the house is considering Slytherin, or if the hat is considering Slytherin for Harry? because of the piece of Voldemort's soul that we know is inside of Harry. Right. Like, is it misleading the, the hat? hat? You know, because the hat's like, I'm never wrong. And it's like, yeah, but how often are you examining a soul that literally has two souls? Right. Yeah. Um, and so what, what's kind of interesting about it is that, like, you know, the fact that um, the turban is insisting that Harry transfer to Slytherin because it was his destiny. Like, to me, that feels like that's what it's saying. Like that, that it is the piece of Voldemort's soul. Oh, that's like telling him to go to Slytherin. Yeah. Or that's that, informing that, the hat. Yeah. Well, well, the other part that you could, uh, I guess you could say, is that because we know that under the turban is Voldemort. Yes. Right. So if, if that's the case, then if the turban is talking to him in his dream, is it possible that like Voldemort is already aware of Harry and like, is he the one behind the dream? Oh, you know, like he's just like, oh, I know who I'm going to mess with tonight. <laughs> well, I think that that's very likely because yeah. we know that like for the first time that Harry, the first time we ever witness um, having like a like a physiological reaction to the proximity to Voldemort is when uh, Quirrell's turban is facing him. Yeah. And in that instance, it basically feels like what what happened is Voldemort was like, there he is. Yep. You know, and like that, that made him feel it made made Voldemort feel some kind of emotion that then. Harry also tends to feel because it seems like that's how it usually works. Yeah, is Harry typically feels the scar hurt whenever Voldemort is feeling something strongly, right? Um, hmm. So that then, yeah, I don't know. I think that's pretty interesting. Um, but it's a pretty, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty telling dream. Um, you know, uh, and and of course, you know, you get a little bit of Malfoy in there, a little bit of Snape in there, both yeah, of whom uh, like throw you off a little. Yeah, pretty much constant red herrings for the next five books, where yeah. you're, you're until they aren't, until they aren't, until they aren't, and you finally, finally, finally get to be like, wow, Harry has only said it like eight million times, and now we finally got to be right. Yep. Um, but yeah, so that that's sort of like what it closes it out on. Uh, I feel like I relate to this dream because I feel like I have dreams like this constantly, where it's just like a total amalgamation of my day's events. Right. Right. Sort of like all morphing into this weird blob of, right. of like connective, like why am I having all of these different people in the same room at the same time? And it's like because they were all stressful things that happened inside of your day and they're all sort right. of like coalesced <laughs> into this weird jelly of, of brain thought. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway. Jelly of brain thought. Jelly of brain thought. Oh, yeah. So anyway, when I read that, I'm like, I've had this dream before. <laughs> Not quite literally, but pretty close. Yeah. 
Um, anyway, so that is chapter seven. That's chapter seven. Yeah, a lot happens. A lot happens. A lot. Of, it's a pretty cool chapter. I feel like I have really enjoyed this one. There's there's so much that we were able to uh, unpack overall from it. So yeah, I mean it's a it's a very important chapter. Harry getting sorted and like the ramifications of this night are like set up most of book two. Yes. Yep, yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um. So there's there. I do have a review. Oh, lay it uh, on me. for the day. This is from uh, everywhere. Adam who says, hey, brother, and then four fire emojis. This is a short one. It just says, I've loved the Harry Potter series for 26 years. The Carlin brothers are my only source for deep dives into the wizard world. Oh, that's so oh, cool. Thanks everywhere, Adam. I love that. Yeah, thank you so much, Adam, for leaving a review. Uh, as ever, if you would like to leave a review uh, you know, on the podcast, it certainly helps us out a lot and some discoverability, and we might just read your review here on the pod. Especially if you're reviewing from Sweden. As just a gentle <laughs> reminder. There, just a gentle yeah. reminder. We we want to get back in number one, okay? We want to be back in your good books. Yeah, back in your good books. Let's do it. You get it? Your good books? I get it. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was incredibly clever. As yes, you yeah. no doubt. No, no doubt. <laughs> anyway, but guys, I think that is all for this week. Yeah, join us uh, next week for Chapter 8, The Potions Master Through the Gryffindor. Welcome, dear listeners. I'm Jonathan Carlin. And I'm Benjamin Carlin. And we invite you to join us through the Gryffindor, your one-way ticket to the enchanting world of Harry Potter. So grab your wands and dust off your broomsticks and join us as we unlock the secrets behind Philosopher's Stone, Chapter 8, The Potions Master. Oh, so omnibus. Yeah, so I feel like I feel like we're, we're this. I found this to be an interesting chapter on the whole, um, because so far as as the story has unfolded for our first seven chapters, I feel like they are all just remarkably heavy with like brand new information, lots of like hard hitting stuff. But I, I feel like this is sort of. Like you're you're sort of in that like mid season like it's not exactly a filler episode like important stuff oh, absolutely happens. important stuff there's a lot of like tiny not necessarily like foreshadowing stuff just sort of stuff that when you read it again the next time you're like oh it's this like, was kind of like an established you can like it feels like it was established earlier but you couldn't have like connected it or predicted it or something right 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 yeah no absolutely i know exactly what you're talking about so um anyway yeah the potions master really is going to be a chapter that revolves around uh harry's first week at hogwarts yeah it, it gives us an introduction to many of the classes yes. that he is going to be taking uh on the on the annual basis this is the real trick is that chapters like this like there are often sections of the story that will do exactly what this chapter does where it's like here were the proceedings at Hogwarts things were changing important important plot device disguised as expositional things happening in the castle like <laughs> it feels like it fe you're right it is designed to feel like a filler chapter so that you miss the important things yeah yeah so I, I do think there's a lot to uh, there's a lot to unlock in here in terms of, of some really really fun details but uh, right away we sort of get like the introduction you know where where like the the chapter starts with minimal context other than just there look where next to the tall kid with the red hair wearing the glasses did you see his face did you see his scar so it's just sort of like marking almost immediately how recognizable Harry's going to be inside of you know the wizarding world yeah. at school you know all of his fellow classmates you know have heard the tale they know who he is it's it's remarkable that he's there so he's you you start to get like a feel for the additional pressure Harry will always have on himself uh, as he moves forward as a student like he's no matter what I mean he's living a rather unique existence but his even compared to other students is is that much more unique absolutely just yeah it's established right away and then you start hearing about the castle itself um, how there's 142 staircases just a, a real popular trivia question remember that one 142 staircases at Hogwarts yeah this is this is one of those where um, I, I remember once upon a time when I was losing so horrendously in the J versus Ben episodes I remember like I was like I'm going to read through I'm going to start making notes I'm going to have like mnemonic devices in different ways to um, like 
to, to remember details. And my, my really ridiculous one is that I remember in elementary school, kids would say one, four, three, uh, or 143 meant I love you because it was like like one for I, four for love, and then three for you. So 143 meant like oh, I oh, love oh, you. Oh, like the number of letters in each thing. Yes. I yeah, was like, yeah. why would that mean that? I, I know. Literally, I had to remember why it worked. Okay. Because I was like, I was like, I know at one point in time I knew how this was a thing, but I can't remember why it is now a thing. Um, but so literally my, my ridiculous device for remembering the staircases is it's 143 minus one. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it's like, I, I love have, you minus one. I have mild attachment. Not like I have. I have some reason why I can remember the number one forty three, and that just helps me then backpedal into one forty two. Yeah. Um, what, the weird okay. thing is, whenever I think of whenever this question comes up, I'm I always the, the number I always think of is one hundred and forty three. Okay. Instead yeah, of one hundred and forty two, right. I don't know why. It just seems like a a more memorable number or something. Maybe it's the I love you thing. Maybe it's the I love yeah. you thing. That's not. I didn't know about that until ten seconds ago. But maybe deep in my memory I did. Can I just say one of the things I found interesting about this is that when it's talking about like all the different staircases, it says um, there are wide. There are wide ones, sweeping ones, narrow, rickety ones, some that led uh, somewhere different on a Friday, some with a vanishing step halfway up that you had to remember to jump. So there, there's a little bit of this, like some that led to uh, somewhere different on a Friday, but there is no actual words that say that the staircases themselves move. And this is like one of those things that like the movie introduces and like as soon as they like enter like the the grand I don't know oh, yeah. hallways yeah. or whatever you know, like you look up and they're all moving like back and forth. But that's actually more of like a movie invention and I don't think it's ever brought up again until like half blood. Really? Prince. Yeah, there's there's not like a really specific line that suggests that like they were on a staircase that like physically moved and then like, you know, prevented them from getting to where they were supposed to go. That's interesting because it does say that like it felt like things are moving around a lot. It was also hard to remember where anything was because it all seemed to move around a lot. Yeah. 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 So it says that right after it describes the kind of stairs there are and it describes a bunch of different kinds of stairs and the way that like maybe they lead different places, but that could be because the landing changes not because the stair moved. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, like it, it's hard oh, to know. That's interesting. The, I know. I thought that was interesting as well because I mean, the the moving staircases is just something that's like in my head canon for the Wizarding World. Yeah, and I think it is canon now because it's like that's like it's it's canon that Rowena Ravenclaw is the one who introduced the moving staircases, right? Yeah, I believe that is correct. Yeah, yeah from her chocolate frog card. I think yeah, that, that is like a detail that is that is known. Um, moving just ever so slightly forward, you also get like um, doors that wouldn't open unless you asked politely or tickled them in exactly the right place. Never tickle a sleeping dragon Ben yeah we made the video guys we made the video it's out there it's it, it is gonna it's gonna yeah because we actually I think that video came out before the episode in which we discovered it in the podcast came out yes yeah, so so we recorded uh, the episode where we were like did Hogwarts used to be a dragon going back to the um, Capit Draconis being the head of the dragon yeah the Gryffindor common room like physically possibly being in that position but the uh, yeah the, the tickling is certainly very interesting um, we, we delved into it a lot honestly the the never tickle a sleeping dragon I felt like ended up being like the really big like just like oh my gosh like that's such a ridiculous motto for the school to have and it never really comes up at all and it's just like because the school's a dragon that's because the school's a dragon it's just and like it, you're taking you're thinking it too metaphorically it's literally a dragon a dragon an actual dragon yeah um, uh, speaking the, of which oh sorry oh I was gonna say just on that tickling front the, the we do know eventually we will learn that the kitchens um, are hidden behind a portrait where if you tickle the pair yep. you do gain access so even though we we know that Harry doesn't learn that until what? When, when do we meet Winky? Fourth year? Fourth year, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we know that it's a while before we'll learn that, but that is one of those. We know that that continues to be like a canon detail, like, yep. a, like something that is revisited. Yep. There's also, it says, um, uh, I like this just tiny inclusion where it's just Harry was sure the coats of armor could walk, and I just wrote like indeed. Yep. It's just like this like very little thing that's like oh boy can they walk? Oh yes. boy, that's a that's a very intentional detail right there. Th yes, they can quite literally defend the castle. They can come needed. to life and fight. Which yeah, is super fun. Um, one of the things this always like it's like you don't think about it because you're like yeah you're at a castle, but like he wouldn't believe they were lost. This Filch catches them doing something. He said he wouldn't believe they were lost. They were sure they were trying to break into it on purpose and was threatening to lock them in the dungeons when they were rescued by Professor Quirrell who was passing. So boy, a couple things about that sentence. First of all, um, it, is, oh, it is so sneaky the way this is done. First yes. of all, though, why like, you don't think about it because they're in a castle and you're like, oh yeah, castles have dungeons, but like it's a school. Like why are there dungeons at all? <laughs> 
Uh, there should be no dungeons. There should be no dungeons unless dungeons are just like basements. I mean, you know, I, I like, thought that I was like, maybe this is the case, but I look, I looked up the word dungeon and it just means like secure prison cell, especially in a castle. Wow. So it's like like there's not like mistaking it. You know, it's not like basement. Is it just another word like dungeon means dungeon as I mean, that's what Phil is doing. He's threatening to lock them in the dungeons. Okay, so here's my thoughts on this because I think I've thought this before like going back to the late ninth century when the founders would have been basically in 10th century, I guess Mm -hmm. uh, founding the school of Hogwarts like I think there's a lot to be said for what is actually going on during this time and like actual real world history and like the perception of magic and witches and the way that people like this were being treated during those periods of time. Um, you know, because this was obviously, you know, so like th- throughout history, even though, you know, magic and stuff, as far as we know, just isn't real in the capacity that we're reading about it. Um, it's not like people have not been punished for such things in the past. So part of me almost thinks that like if you were to really delve again into that founder series and get a feel for what the founders were trying to accomplish with the castle of Hogwarts, it, it almost occurs to me that there's some outside possibility that it wasn't solely intended to be just a school, right. but, but also like a multifunctional. Yeah, like it like as a castle, was it more of like a, a genuine fortress or something like a line like, of defense? Yeah, because and we also know that Hogsmeade, the town that literally exists right next to Hogwarts, I think think is the only known uh at least in England the only exclusively wizarding population right. like so even Godric's like, Hollow has muggles like yeah um, so was this like a like a a place for the town to retreat to in the case of in case of attack or something almost certainly is, is yeah. sort of what my mind would say so like I almost feel like what was what the founders were really attempting to do was provide safe haven for the wizarding world and then once that was sort of happening and once there was a place for people to potentially go it was like we can act, we can also like be teaching people while we're here and like that way if they have control of their magic then it's altogether less dangerous you know like right. te- teach a code of conduct right um, so, you know, I, I certainly think because you know, the statute of secrecy won't be created for centuries. Yeah, I think it's not until like the 1600s or 1700s when that's that's put into place. Right. Um, I can't remember the specific detail, but either way, I mean, it means that there's there's a good possibility, especially being so remote that they were just quite literally trying to provide a place for for people to go and hide. Yeah, you know, uh, that, that's on. what it seems to me. I mean, the fact that they have dungeons means that they at one point were used for housing prisoners. So the castle must have served that function at some point, but it's certainly not for students. Certainly not for students. Yeah, filch, filch. the poltergeist. The poltergeist. Um, the other interesting thing about that exact sentence is that it says like it's it's this is such a tricky sentence because filch is getting Harry and them in trouble for um, accidentally trying to get through the entrance of the out of bounds corridor where fluffy is. They don't know that yet, but they're rescued by Professor Quirrell who is passing by and it's like you think oh he rescued them. That's great. And it's like no, 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 no. He was he's investigating yes. the spot like that's why he's there and it's like it paints him as a good guy, but it's like a small detail that like no, he's the bad guy. It's like that's that's why Quirrell was there. Yeah, it, it's that's like, why Quirrell he, was yeah. there. It's like it's not convenient timing and, and like if anything like Quirrell probably like I, I imagine if you were to see the whole scene through his lens, you, what you would witness is him almost having a sense of feeling caught himself. Yeah. And then being like, oh, no, Filch, these these kids are fine. Like, yeah. you know, like like realizing in the moment, like, wait, no, I have the authority here. Like, right. You know, exactly. Like I'm a teacher. Like, as far as as far as anybody else knows, I'm just a teacher. I'm allowed to be here. Right. Um, but yeah. So again, I, I know that we talked a little bit about it in the last chapter, but um, I feel like you are getting a, a really significant contrast here between the, the two paragraphs adjoining. So basically you get one big paragraph about peeves and what happens if you run into peeves and then you get a big paragraph about filch and what happens if you run into filch uh-huh. and it's it's just again just I mean these two are the antithesis of one another like they are they are exact equal opposites of one another it's like I, I mean even the length of paragraph looks the exact same it really does like yeah. this is I mean I, I, I don't want to harp on it for too long because I know we talk about it all the time but it really has just always been one of my favorite theories and I feel like I would love for this one to just be properly confirmed like it, yeah. it seems it seems so harmless otherwise it doesn't change anything about the story so just a poltergeist it just sort of explains at least the connection between him and Mrs. Norris. There's like something magical. Yes, yes, almost certainly. Almost certainly. Yep. Um, um, not to mention Filch also knows all the secret passageways which we learn about. Uh, you know, it, it does mm-hmm. it does say because uh, he's part of the castle because yep. he's part of the castle. Exactly. Yep. He knows it better than anyone except for maybe the Weasley twins map uh, foreshadowing. 
right there. Yep, yep. yep. So it's kind of like a little bit of a nod to the fact that the Weasleys are already like one step ahead. Oh my they, gosh, there's so many nods to Fred and George being like such troublemakers and such like like n- so knowledgeable about the castle. Like even in just like th- this chapter alone, I think I wrote it down later on. Like there's so many nods to them. Well, that's the thing. Like this is where I've always said. Like you know, people ask a lot. Like you know, what could the new um, like HBO series or something do? to provide something new to the story overall. And I always come back to Fred and George. Like you can't really tell like it's not like you need like the story as told by Ron, the story as told by Hermione, because like they're just so adjacent to Harry all the time that they're effectively part of the main story always. Yeah. So it's like who then becomes like your secondary characters whose whose tale you want to follow and I, I just love Fred and George. They're like two of my favorite like Harry Potter characters of oh, all time. They're so. fantastic. I mean, yeah. I think yeah, another scene you I could almost see like Harry goes to bed after the first night, wakes up the next day, and you just see him pushing on the door with Fluffy. Filch walks up and it's like, hi, hey, get out of here or whatever. Nice Filch. Yeah, yeah thank no, you. But, thank yeah. you. And then you see Quirrell show up and then like later in the season as he's like explaining it to Harry, you can see like the flashback where like what really happened. Oh, yeah, kind of thing, you yep. know, yep. that's the sort of thing I think would be interesting. Um, I think there's an interesting sentence here that says there was a lot more to magic as Harry's quickly found out than waving your wand and saying a few funny words and it's like that's true, but also a lot of times that is all it is. <laughs> you know, we yeah, we talk about the magic systems sometimes that are used in different fantasy novels and it's really fascinating because I actually had never caught this before, but on this particular pass through I was like, wait a second, this stands out to me all of a sudden, um, but yeah, so in in the world of Harry Potter, it always feels like we're dealing with what is largely regarded as a soft magic system, which largely is sort of like this big question of like what physical toll does it ultimately take on the witch or wizard to cast a spell like if you were in a duel and you're just blasting spells back and forth. Are you exhausted from that? Does it like sap a certain kind of like inner um, like mana energy that like you Mm -hmm. know that like fuels your magic as time goes on? Do you have like a like a recharge? period or anything right um, or or can you just continuously you know cast and it seems like for the most part like the incantation is sort of like a way to direct your efforts and sort of like associate the intended magic with an otherwise movement because we know the incantation itself is not necessary uh, because there is nonverbal magic, right? Um, you know, so that's that's a certain piece of it. You've also got the fact that the you can channel your magic through any object, but like wands are most adept at doing so. Mm-hmm. So it means like you could technically pick up like a piece of chalk and probably like make something come from right. a piece of chalk because well, you don't even need a wand. You know, like Harry is doing magic. You know, he makes the glass disappear. At yes, the zoo, right? Wand, like wandless magic is a thing too. Yeah, and when you learn about like you know wizards in North America, you'll learn that like you know the like you know native people to the area were basically just doing wandless magic. Like yeah, like they didn't have of, wands. Like that was just their specialty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I found to be particularly interesting is because the story that we always like to really compare uh, the magic system to of Harry Potter is our other favorite you know fantasy series, which is called Name of the Wind or the King Killer Chronicles, and they use a type of magic called sympathy, which basically goes into a whole bunch of different things. But it's basically like physics based magic essentially. Yeah, Um, but one of the things that's really fascinating is that in the very next page um, we learned that in their first transfiguration class uh, McGonagall tasks them with changing a match into a needle and there's actually a little bit of a sympathetic link going on. I feel like there because you quite literally have two objects that are like similar in size and stature. Yeah, which should make the conversion like a little bit more uh, simple in in the scheme of things. So like for this to be the starting point to use two objects that are so similar suggests on some level that like that similarity aids in the ease of conversion. It seems like it almost lends itself to like the, even the possibility of it. Like I don't think you could turn like a matchstick into like a pig. Well, you know? that, I mean, we see her in this change a desk into a pig. Oh, I know, but a desk is more pig shaped to begin with. That's true. Like it has yeah. it has four legs, right? That's a good point. It is like the appropriate. So maybe you could turn a matchstick into like a really tiny pig, right? Well, one of you the know. other details I was I was looking into because I was trying to feel like the different things that they do in, in class and like at one point in time they convert like pin cushions into uh, like little hedgehogs or porcupines, which is yeah. like again, you know, like those are fairly similar. Yeah, but the other one that I found fascinating is that eventually they'll do guinea pigs into guinea fowl and guinea Guinea pigs are like a small, um, like you know, a little bit bigger hamster. Yeah, like a, like a, like a little rodent type yeah. thing. And a guinea fowl is closer to like a chicken. And yeah. so what's interesting about that is it's actually the the name is right. the same. So you have guinea <laughs> and guinea. So there's a little bit of that sympathetic link going on, even though it's only in the proper name for the for the item. So right. Anyway, I found that to be just kind of magic cares about puns. 
Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah a little yeah, bit yeah, for yeah, sure. Into consideration. It's quirky yeah. like that. Uh, okay, so um, the, you keep going through his classes here. Uh, I thought it was interesting that like so he's going through all the different classes he has, or like it, it's introducing you to the number of different people in the castle and stuff. But I think it's so funny that like you always think of how Hogwarts is this like constantly happy, magical place, but like. If you're going through this, like Professor Bins is super boring, Peeves terrible, Filch terrible, Snape mean, McGonagall hard. It's like all <laughs> the classes seem like it seems kind of rough. Even Sprout is is described. Yeah. And I, I was like, I was like, poor Sprout. The description of her, the first one we ever get is dumpy little witch, right. <laughs> which I was like, well, that feels like an insult well, on, on any now. level you choose. I was like, poor. I mean, Sprout. Look, I tell you what, I'm 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 here for you. Okay, just yeah. so you know. Um, okay. Yeah, you 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 are correct. I mean, it says, I mean, even when you get to, did you say Quarrels class, which, you know, everybody oh, yeah. was super excited about it. It turned out to be a bit of a joke. A bit of a joke. It's like, okay, what are we learning anything? A- in? Anything at all? Are we anything actually at all? being educated in, I this, know. in this system here? Okay. Also, one of the, this is just like a little Easter egg, I, or not even Easter egg, but like um, in Professor Bin's class, it says they compute, the students are confusing Emmerich the evil and Eric the oddball, yeah. which has to just be based on the fact that their names sound similar because like what they're each famous for is like wildly different. Oh, no. Way. Okay. Yeah. So first of all, Emmerich the evil goes on to he does get mentioned again as a former master of the elder wand or at least wielder. I don't know about master. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. That's yeah. one. Like, I think I think um, Xenophilius mentions him later on as well. So that's wow, sort of there. What a throwback. He was okay. killed by Egbert the egregious in gruesome fashion, oh, sure, which you know again, if you had the elder wand and was truly master of it, you the elder wand sucks at winning duels like it is. It does not do what it says on the box. Well, that's I just think the legend is is mistake. It's just I mean, wrong. Yeah, the, the whole I mean, we could we could probably do just an entire episode about nothing but the elder wand. I mean, we, we've we made like 10 videos about nothing but the elder wand on yeah. the main channel and I still don't even know exactly where I stand. On I it, think but. I think our most recent pass out of that you need to be worthy to be like a true map like anyone can hold it and do magic and it right. will it is better at like, you know, choosing or like uh, working for anyone than like say like Ron's hand me down wand sure sure, then sure. then most wands, but like the the thing that makes it appear to constantly be powerful is that powerful people think it's powerful, so they seek it out and then because they are powerful, they do things with it. Yes, it's yes. like what Olivander says like you know, uh, terrible, terrible. Yes, but great, right? It's right, like right, this yeah. is the nature of the elder wand. It is constantly wheel well, well, we, we, well being well, welt well. by <laughs> by uh, gr- uh, terrible, but great people. And so it gets this reputation as being good. But as far as I'm concerned, the only two people to ever have genuinely been masters of the elder wand that we are aware of are Dumbledore and Harry, because they're the only two people who we ever see genuinely perform extraordinary, like, magic. extraordinary magic and that piece of magic is the same for both of them and it is repairing a wand Dumbledore repair repairs Hagrid's whereas uh, Harry repairs his own which Ollivander says shouldn't be possible and Ollivander you you think you can trust to know since his family has been doing it for over 1200 years or something. yeah it's just been forever and a half. so Yep. No, I, yep. I, I yep, absolutely agree. Okay. Both, it's like Mjolnir. So did you end up telling me who Yurik the oddball? Yurik the oddball is a, a, a appropriately named super odd guy. He used to wear a jellyfish as a hat cool. and he would sleep with 50 auguries in the room with him. Um, 50 50 and of course the auguries have this like bad reputation of like predicting um, death. Yeah, but what they actually predict is oncoming rain, but um, he w- slept with 50 of them. and There was a big storm coming, so they're all going crazy. He woke up and assumed because they were all yelling so loudly that he must be dead and was a ghost and gave himself a concussion trying to walk through walls, which he couldn't because because he wasn't dead. Yeah, <laughs> but he was possibly he was in Ravenclaw and was possibly taught by Rowena herself. Okay, um, that's interesting. Yeah, so I'm not really sure why he's confused with Emmerich because they're not really the same in that way at all. Yeah, but, this is this is like one of those things where it's like, are they is, is like what it what is coming down to that like Bins is just this inefficient at at teaching. Oh, why this is another one. It's like, why does Dumbledore let Professor Bins continue to be the teacher? Like, it's just such a bad staffing choice. Like, all of the students are bored. Uh, yeah, you know, like, like to problematic degrees. Yeah, yeah. This is this is. I mean, the, and it's interesting too. You know, it's like Dumbledore is always kind of 
odd with with who he elects to hire for all the positions. Like even going through all this, I mean, like McGonagall is. I mean, Flitwick never really has anything negative, super attached to him at all. But you know, McGonagall feels like she's she's probably like the most effective teacher. Snape seems like he just right. simply scares everyone. Sna- yeah, I mean, anytime I feel like you see Snape teaching, it's just like I wrote the instructions on the chalkboard. Do it. It's that's like, all. It's like, I'll be here doing no instruction at all. Yeah, there's, there's yeah. Like, that's it's, not incredibly you helpful. Know, yeah, even when Slughorn's there, he's like, ooh, I suppose you added some peppermint to counteract the whatever, whatever, whatever. It's like, that's a useful tip. Right, right, right. It's like, like, it's, Snape's not passing out peppermint tips. That, that's the thing, too, is like, Snape, we know that Snape is the Half-Blood Prince. We know that he has all these tips that he's written in like the ledgers right. of his books. It's like, why is he not literally teaching all of his students exactly these things? I know. This is, this is like one of those things where it's like, it's almost like a vanity issue where it's like you know the teacher becomes the master no the student becomes the master got that right that second time um where it's almost like was snape just like having like a pride related issue when he was just like worried that one of his students would become better than him at his own craft? <laughs> right he's like i know all the secrets and i'm a teacher i'm not going to tell you the secrets because I earned those myself by figuring them out. That's not for you to know. I know that's like, it's yeah. like no, this is the exact. This is, this this is, is why the student becomes the master because they have the benefit of all of the teaching, right? Yeah, like you, you are like actively withholding information from your student. You're being a bad teacher on purpose. It feels like yeah. Anyway, well, more on Snape in just a second because there, yeah, was, there was another the little, chapter is called the potions master. I know. Yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll definitely spend some more time on him, um, but I wanted to I wanted to just touch on a little detail. So we get into Quirrell's room, um, which you know, this is we're, do, we're doing DADA, which we know eventually will go on to be Harry's like most prominent class, although yeah. not for any help from his first two years of education in the no. subject. He basically learns in years three, four, and I guess in six. Um, but yeah, I like, guess Snape but is teaching him then. But. One, one, two, and five. So like of his six years at school, um, Harry, the high school dropout, has three actual years of education in, yeah. in defense against the dark guards, uh, and is apparently like the best ever at it. So I don't know how to I don't know how to explain that. Um, but one of the things I thought was just kind of funny, or I was like, I wonder if this is supposed to be a nod. But um, he says his turban, he told them, had been given to him by an African prince as a thank you for getting rid of a troublesome zombie. I have literally no idea if this is intended to be like a, a little bit of like a spoof on like the classic um, a, like Nigerian prince. You Email scam that, oh. that popped up, <laughs> you know, because during like I think like the late '90s, early 2000s, it was just like a really common um, like like trope of a scam that would happen it was essentially like a like a wealthy um, African prince essentially would reach out to you and say like, hey, I'm on hard times, but if you can help me like through this difficult you know piece or whatever, then I will like reward you beyond your wildest dreams or something. And people were like, oh, I mean, it's a prince reaching out for help. Of course, I'll help. Of course. Um, but like obviously, like even the the class is like it says literally the next sentence, but they weren't sure they believed this story. And it's like even that feels like it like falls in line. Like, you know, if you're just like an everyday household United States resident. Why would a like a Nigerian prince be reaching out to you in particular? Right. Like, it's like you know, like you should be skeptical of that story. Basically, is is what it comes down to. And so I have I don't know whether or not it's supposed to be a nod at all, but I had never caught that before, and I was like, oh, I wonder if that's like a like a joke or anything there. Well, it's almost certainly not true because we know the real reason he wears the turban is to um, yeah, conceal right, yes. Voldemort in you know on the back of his head. What's interesting is that I think it um it's like I think it it. it like when you meet Quirrell in the movies, he's immediately wearing the turban, but yeah. it sounds like maybe he wasn't wearing the turban until term started. Yeah, I like, think that's true. Yeah, so yeah. like when when Harry meets him in the in the leaky cauldron, he's not wearing the turban the first time. Correct. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's because like so again, we I think we've talked about that a little bit, but it's like, you know, Harry reaches out and is able to shake Quirrell's hand at the leaky cauldron without you know, it yeah, being impactful. without hurting him. So that that must mean that Voldemort has not yet taken up residence in the back of Quirrell's head. Yeah, yet, but so. now he has. Now he has. Yep, for now sure. He's there. Which also there is a nod to that as well, where it says a funny smell hung around the turban. That's just Voldemort. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, is this to suggest that Voldemort smells bad? Yeah, well, I mean, if you I mean, like, I mean, uh, I'm thinking of like during COVID times, you have to wear a mask all day and it's like, you know, you're just sort of breathing into the mask all day. Like the mask doesn't smell great by the end of the day. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I so, got you. And I he's just you. back there just like breathing in his own bad breath all day. <laughs> that, that is just a ridiculous thing to think about is Voldemort just being like, oh, this really stinks. I know. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, everyone's just going to be quiet back here. I can't say anything. 
the, the, the ruler of all darkness. I'm just stuck in the back of this guy's head under a turban. <laughs> yeah, just just absolutely no sympathy for for old uh, for old Voldemort yeah. over there. Oh, also, the next day, I just I always think this is just funny where they're eating breakfast and uh, what have we got today? Harry asked Ron as he poured sugar on his porridge, and I'm like, Harry, you were at magic school. Why are you eating porridge? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. There has got there has got to be better options than porridge. <laughs> than porridge, <laughs> like yeah, but which like, can't even be that good. You're like dumping sugar on it. Like even you were like, yeah, it's only okay. Right, right. right. <laughs> it's like, like I feel like throughout the like the future of of all of um all of wizarding meals. Yeah, well, I don't know. Like occasionally, maybe Harry just likes plain food. Plain food. He's yeah. just like, I want baked potatoes and porridge. Yeah, just, just, just. just <laughs> uh, I'll take them together. Even mm-hmm. um, I, I, this was this was something I never really super considered before. But uh, the double potions with the Slytherins. I, this was like one of those things. I've always interpreted double potions or any double class as um, like back to back lessons. But I, I, I don't know whether or not like they've had classes with anybody else so far. So it was like it's like this could be interpreted as double potions means you're taking a class with another house at the same time. I think that is what it means, but they never describe it as like double care of magical creatures with the Slytherins. Yeah, that's true. It does seem like like potions is the one they always have double of, but but then I think they're supposed to be taking Trans, no, um, not transfiguration. Uh, herbology, like three days a week. Yeah, and so, they take. And um, I know in at least their second year, they have herbology with the Hufflepuffs. Right. So is that double yeah. herbology? Is that double herbology? Or yeah, does double mean that the class is back to back? Which would almost make sense for potions because you think maybe you need like a longer time to brew the potion or something. Well, like in college, yeah. Like I, I like took you know like geology for example because I just needed the science. But you know it was like one of those things where I would have like the practical where you would go in and um, they would like teach you about. The, the rocks and minerals and such like that. And then you would have the lab afterwards. So class was like three hours long because you'd spend the first hour and a half learning and the second hour and a half like right doing whatever doing the, lab. Yeah, yeah. the lab. Yeah, yeah, um, so well, I, yeah. So yeah, uh, so I don't know. I don't know whether it means potions class is just two classes back to back or if it just means that you're having class with the second house, but either way we know they constantly have a double or at least potions with the Slytherins and care of magical creatures with the Slytherins yes. and it seems like I think they have um, uh, what you're my butt. I just said it herbology with the Hufflepuffs. I, I don't think there is a single case where we see the Gryffindors having class with the Ravenclaws ever ever. Yeah, yeah. Like we, we really we don't we know the fewest Ravenclaws I think of any any other house as we, yeah. as we learn more about you know the other students in his right. year and stuff. So that is that is very interesting. Real quick there, too, we do get the letter from Hagrid inviting Harry down uh, to have tea after his first week. This is something that makes Harry happy though because he is then of course heading to his least favorite class where basically right away we get the line um, like it, Harry says at the start of term banquet Harry had gotten the idea that Professor Snape disliked him. By the end of the first potions lesson he knew he'd been wrong. Snape didn't dislike Harry. He he hated him. Fact. <laughs> yes. Straight fact. Yeah. Um, Snape basically goes on the offensive right away. Yeah. Like this. I mean, it's like the least professional thing he could possibly do. It's, it really is. You know, it's like, I mean, it has to be the case. And, you know, it's like I, I, you know, I'm sure if you talk to any teacher, I guarantee that there are students in every class where it's just like it would make my life a lot easier if you were just simply not in this class, you know, because like because it's always trouble. It's always something. But like, I still don't think that they are like unnecessary. Like it is still not OK to be unfairly difficult on those students. You know, it's like right. they are still just students that you still have to treat them. Well, at this like point, he hasn't has. done anything either. I know. Yeah. So he's just like just just right away. He's just super, super mean. Yeah, um, there is um, you, you do sort of get like a little bit of an idea that that despite the fact that he always seems to covet the defense against the dark arts position um, that he does have a deep passion for potions in the way that he describes like the subtle science and exact art of potion making. Yeah, so he's talking about like what you can learn in this class and he says I can teach you how to bottle fame brew glory and even put a stopper on death and I was like trying to think if those things actually came to pass at any point I like, mean brew glory could be um, Felix Felicis that is what I wrote or is that Felix Felicis and then I can teach you how to bottle fame I wrote like polyjuice potion next to that because they literally all transform into Harry who is famous at one point like the, you've sort of bottled fame in that way. I don't know if that counts. Yeah, but, but like otherwise you would think that this would largely be like if it was just a potion that simply made you famous somehow a la 
genie making Aladdin a prince, you know, like, right, it, yeah, it seemed like, you know, if you took it and all of a sudden it's just like there's an entire wealth of knowledge about you as a person and all of your accolades and you are like a well-known person because you drank this potion. It's like, I don't know how that would work. It seems like Gilderoy Lockhart. Absolutely. It would have been like an easier path to success to just brew a whole bunch of, of yeah, whatever that was, whatever but to your, but exactly what you just said, if you could just turn into a person who everyone knew about, that would be like taking Polyjuice potion and just doing that with someone. That's true. Everyone already knew about. Yes, that's a very good yeah. point. That is a very good point, which I mean does come up and then even stop or death. I just wrote down like Bezor, which he does literally teach them by the end of this page. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, yes, and so Harry does use it. <laughs> yeah, so the Bezor is kind of an interesting one um, because we, we do know that like fast forward to year six. Um, Harry will learn from Snape again the half blood prince that like the ultimate antidote for most things is just simply shoving a Bezor down their throat and it will pretty much it, it's maybe not like a perfect cure all but like like in most cases it will work. I know um, I think there's a funny moment there where I think because um, Harry pulls out the Bezor in class and like you know, Slughorn is like, ah, oh, 10 points for sheer cheek, you know, or whatever. Yes. And, he sh- and, you know, Hermione is all mad because Harry learned about it from the book. And he's like, you could have learned about it in our first year if you've been listening to Professor Snape. And it's like, he still learned it from Professor Snape at the he, end. He did yeah. still learn it from that. That is such a good point. That is yeah. such a good point. Interestingly, with the Bezor, we've actually, you and I have held one. Before. A real one. Yeah. Bezor is a real thing. It's not yeah. like they won't magically. Well, no, they don't like cure you from poison. No, no, but, but I think that they are from the stomach of a goat. They are from the stomach of a goat, and I think the the actual use in the wizarding world was the believed use of them in the real world at one point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this this is not like necessarily invented. <coughs> this is like more based on like kind of like some historical, yeah, um, like like um, you know, magic, I guess. Yeah, uh, or proposed magic rather. The other really kind of interesting one here, and I've seen a lot of speculation about this line. Although I th- I think that it's maybe not as like grounded, but I, I sort of love it. Ev- like either way, uh, if this was the intent Attention. But so Snape uh, says, what would I get if I added powdered root of asphodel to an infusion of wormwood? Mm-hmm. Um, this is an asphodel is a kind of lily. Oh, um, and it means remembrance and supposedly wormwood is associated with regret. And basically it's like essentially what Snape could be asking or saying here in code to Harry is effectively like I regret the loss of your mother, Lily. Oh, like, right. So it's like it's like deeply coded, and it, Harry would never have any way of like determining this. Well, possibly he could, I guess, because the thing you would actually make if you mix them together is the draft of living death. Yes, which is also then could be a reference to Lily, I guess. Although it it's not the draft of living death doesn't kill you; it just puts you into a sleep. Um, but interestingly, um, for this like uh, comparison uh, in. Harry's sixth year for his first class with Slughorn when they're competing to win the Felix Felicis. Yes. What they're supposed to brew is the draft of living death. Yes, which is so interesting that it comes. It's the very first thing he's asked about, and then it's the one that Harry brews correctly to win the um, Felix Felicis. Although I went and read that chapter again as well after this, and surprisingly, even though um, the, it talks about roots, it talks about like Harry and like Ron chopping up the roots at the beginning. Those are Valerian roots. So part of the draft of living death includes chopped Valerian roots, powdered root of asphodel and an infusion of wormwood like these two ingredients don't come up in book six, even though they're both mentioned right here. Oh, interesting. Yeah, interesting. so it's like he's only giving you about half the ingredients here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. That, that is that is definitely pretty pretty fascinating as well. Um, and yeah, I love I do love the fact though that, that like a lot of this stuff does end up ultimately you know coming back. Uh, you know, as yeah. the, as the story continues yeah. as well. That's also, th- this is another just random thing. It's like um, Hermione like immediately puts her hand in the air because she knows the answer to the question. But it's like it's confusing to me that even Hermione knows the answer to the question. Like, what would you do here? Because we know that the draft of living death is a newt or an NEWT level potion. So like why would there have been any information about it at all in the year one books she got? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. One, one, thousand, one thousand magical herbs and fungi and fungi. Yeah, yeah. Which which interestingly seems like it would be the herbology book. It does not the potions book, but I yeah. guess maybe this is like one of those areas where it's like herbology is quite literally growing the ingredients that could be. It does. Seem, there's probably a lot of crossover like Certainly. when you're like when you're learning about historical events in English because it helps you understand the book rather than learning about those historical events in history. Precisely. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's that's a really good example. Um, the other thing that happens here is that um, basically, you know, uh, Harry does sort of snap back, snap back 
at Snape a little bit here. And uh, he said, you know, he basically like, you know, he's being grilled with all these questions very unfairly to which Harry says, I don't know, said Harry quietly. I think Hermione does though. Why don't you try her? Um, which is completely like reasonable, you know, from Harry's perspective. He's like, I don't know what's going on or why you're picking on me, but someone's raising their hand, right? Um, I do think it's interesting that Snape says in a point will be taken from Gryffindor house for your cheek. Oh, the point scaling is like, yeah, the, the point power creep or whatever. The point power creep is really interesting, but I, I actually feel like there's a reasonable explanation and uh, like, I, I mean, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on it, but sometimes it occurs to me that like as you're one students, you're more likely to make mistakes or not know answers oh. and because everything is like a lower level. I almost am curious like if as a first year student, it's like typical um, uh, like point gains and losses might be smaller because the, the the associated victories and losses are also smaller, right? Like the amount of knowledge needed to have mastered to earn points as a first year isn't as great as seventh year. So seventh year points are like weighted heavier. Exactly. Mm, yeah, I yeah. do like that explanation, although I guess you can still lose points for certain out of bounds in this because they go on to lose like 50 points a piece later on. Yes. And I mean, that's the type of thing that I think would probably, especially if you were like a first year, you know, a freshman in the yeah. school and like your upperclassmen, like, I mean, that would be in and of itself reason to stay in bounds because losing 50 points as a first year, it's like you're not even supposed to be able to do that. Like right. you're not even in the zip code of, of losing 50 points. You right. should be losing a point or gaining a point. Yeah, you at know, a time. Like, yeah, at a time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it feels much more incremental. So uh, that that's sort of like my own personal headcanon as to how and why the point totals seem to go from it seems like one point at a time in in these opening chapters to eventually it seems like almost more of like a five to ten. Yeah, point. five to ten points for yeah, certain increments. things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, moving on, there's another sentence here where it says Harry forced himself to keep looking straight into those cold eyes, and that's like a pretty interesting one because we know that is uh, that Snape is a legilimens, and so I was like, is Snape reading his mind right now? Yeah, like, I bet he is. He probably is. Um, this, this is actually another one that we've talked about before, and it's kind of deeply upsetting to even consider. But one of the big questions we've always had is that Harry looks exactly like James, except for the eyes. Um, but we've always said, like, what would happen if Harry had been like Lily's double? You oh, know? And right. So like all of a sudden what has showed up and, and I mean, Ginny could possibly, I don't know, maybe not really be a good case study for it. But, um, you know, the question would be like if Harry showed up and looked was the spitting image of Lily, would Snape have treated him differently? Oh, man. Yeah, but it feels like he would have. Yeah, it, it feels like he would have. Yeah, because you would have been looking at you know, this person he loved rather than this person he despised. Right. You know, because that, that's always what's weird to me is that it's like, you know, Snape is so mean. But oh. like this person is still part Lily. Oh, the other thing here is, is Harry forced himself to keep looking straight into those cold eyes. The other thing Snape could be doing is looking at Harry's eyes oh. because that's the part of him that looks like Lily. You're right. Oh, boy, that's just gave myself chills. That's I know, weird. That's, yeah, that is weird. That, that is does weird. sound I think that's more likely. I than, think that's more likely. Yeah, than reading his mind in that moment. Yeah, yeah, because this is like the first time he would have seen it, like seen Harry's eyes properly. Ooh, oh, man, oh, that's weird. That is weird. Uh, okay, um, moving on. Uh, the next thing he says, or the next thing he reveals, is that Monk's Hood and Wolf's Bane are the same plant. They are go by the name of Aconite. I feel like in retrospect, this feels like a light, um, like um, Lupin. Uh, reference yeah as well because wolf's bane is part of the wolf's bane potion and this is sort of just like a, an early hint i guess snape might not know how much harry knows about like james and his friends or anything sure. but this is like it, it feels like if you're including this to harry then it's like yes i know about the werewolf kind of thing yeah that's that's a good point um and i mean especially if the you know if you were to make the assertion and i'd be curious if you could if you could draw anything out from these other questions that he's asking if he is in some way shape or form alluding to each of the founders and lily um, in any way, shape, or form, like I mean, like like we said, I mean, one of the things he's asked about is is possibly already a direct reference to the loss of Lily Potter, um, you know. And if if this one here is supposed to be a little reference to Lupin, it's like does the does the Bazaar or um, what else does he have in here? He ha he has a few questions that he, he kind of like rattles off all at once. It, it would just be interesting if like somehow they were like, like <laughs> yeah, that's the serious Black reference or like that's yeah. the Peter reference. That would be interesting. Yeah, man, I don't know. 
da, 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 da. yeah, I guess yeah. we can we can try and look further I know, yeah, into that's... that, but it does seem like at least two of them get referenced right there. Yes, yes, indeed. Yep. Um, as we move forward a little bit, we see that, you know, like Neville obviously right away is starting to uh, sort of struggle under the pressure that comes from uh, Snape's teaching method. <laughs> he just straight up calls him an idiot. Yeah, I underlined that. <laughs> I, I know, was like, I was like, so uncalled for. Like, it's one thing to hate Harry because he looks like your mortal enemy. Yeah. It is another to just bully Neville for no reason. Oh, I know. Well, I mean, even then, you know, he like he, he even takes it up on. He takes it out on Harry one step further after poor Neville's already been sent to the hospital wing. You Potter, why didn't you tell him not to add the quill? <laughs> Thought he'd make you look good if he got it wrong. Did you? It's like Snape. How are you pulling this stuff? Like where? How are you? I don't even know how you think to think to be this mean. I know. It's like, you know, he's just down there teaching the six years Hufflepuffs at one point in the air and he's like, what? What is this? Where's Potter? This is his fault. This is, I, yeah. I, you know what? I bet it was Harry. I I, bet it, this is this has got Potter all over all it. All over it. It's like it's like I was in a different class, sir. What you, what you, I'm not even in Hufflepuff. <laughs> yeah, so what, this is not relevant yet, uh, but I always love to imagine what it's like for Snape to have to teach Luna potions. <laughs> Oh yeah, you know, yeah, just yeah. Like that'd be really funny. No, it would be um, hilarious to see Luna in in Snape's class because well, I'd like to think that Luna would just be good at this. You know, like I mean, she is a Ravenclaw. I mean, yeah, she, she's very intelligent. Like it's, it, I like to think that like she'd be the type of person who would just like like uh, intuitively know some of like the prince's secrets. Oh, I know. Like, like oh, yeah. I added the sprig of peppermint. It's believed that blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I it's know like, like she's getting the right answers for the wrong reasons or yes, something. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's, that's <laughs> so Luna, which yeah. I would, which I feel like would be uh, that could be like a skit unto itself. Yeah. It's just like watching Snape be like, that is a good point. <laughs> <laughs> so I, can't, I can't fault your, I can't fault what you did. It, it all worked out. Uh, as we move forward onto the next page, uh, Ron is trying to cheer up Harry, and we do get that one another one of those references to Fred and George. Yep. Uh, where speaking of Snape teaching other students, it says Snape's always taking points off of Fred and George, um, which you know is kind of like one of those things. It's just sort of a testament again that's like Fred and George are doing it right. If Snape doesn't like you, it's like that means you're probably you got it yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, 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 doing a good thing there. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, is Hagrid spent half his life chasing your twin brothers away from the forest? It's like, what are they doing in there? Yep. Who knows? Um, this is this is like one of those things where I have since learned thanks thanks to the uh, the Great British Baking Show that rock cakes are in fact just a um, common British like 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 food. Um, oh, 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 but this I, I always thought was just sort of like a slam on Hagrid's cooking. <laughs> that is what I thought as well. Yeah, but but in fact, rock cakes are something that you would commonly find, I think, in, in like, a, you know, like a British environment. But like the fact that it's also paired up with the fact that they're like tooth breaking, you know, it's sort of like it just sort of seems like what he's effectively doing is serving something that's closer to a rock than a cake. Right. Yes. He's, yeah. Like rock cakes are a thing. Hagrid is making rock cakes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that but that's that's something that forever and ever and ever I would have just I, I always would have assumed that was like Boy, a wizarding thing, not a not this a is like stirring up a completely random memory in my brain from fourth grade when we went when I, there was a class trip we went on to Williamsburg okay and I remember that like uh, it was like an overnight trip so this is like the big fourth grade trip you got to go on amazing and while you're there and like I think mom came and she chaperoned and you know I was like so excited to get like souvenirs for you know everyone else in the family had nah. to you know bring them back some like handmade soap or you know something like that oh, right and right. I think one of the things were these like these like I think they were called like it was like hard rolls or something but they were just these like you know it was exactly what it sounds like it's like a very just stale piece of bread, I think, or like a really, really hard piece of bread. And I remember thinking, like, oh, I'm getting this for dad, obviously. So excited. I couldn't like I was like, this is such a cool thing. Like it's 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 hard on purpose. <laughs> he's like, he's gonna love he's it. He's gonna love it. And, uh, yeah, fourth grade me was like, I cannot I can I'm so excited to get this to dad. And I remember like I can still picture like him at the table, like absolutely doing his best to like seem excited about it and not be able to take a bite of it because it was such like a hard <laughs> roll. Rock solid. I've never I don't anyway. think I've ever heard that story, but oh, that's man. hysterical. It just, it just made me think of it. And I was like, oh, now I feel so embarrassed. Like I, I must have misunderstood the roles or something as a child, but I was like, I understand this completely and it's so cool. Well, I love that mom was just like completely if she was there and she was like, do it. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I cannot wait to see your dad's yeah. face when when you present him with a rock hard roll. Um, anyway, well, that's hilarious. Yeah, uh, good to there know that go. we've we've mm -hmm. all been there. Yep. Um, let's see. Um, 
going forward, uh, we hear Hagrid talking a little bit about Mrs. Norris. Uh, and no, I know there, there's sort of like an interesting line that I was kind of curious as to like whether or not you could pull a string on uh, or if we ever have in the past, if, if anything tickles your your thoughts there. But uh, one of the things that we learn uh, is Hagrid says, as for the cat, Mrs. Norris, I'd like to introduce her to Fang sometime. Do you know every time I go up to the school, she follows me everywhere. Can't get rid of her. Filch puts her up to it, I think. Um, and this, this is like one of those where it's like, why would Mrs. Norris follow Hagrid everywhere? Right. Yeah, like, I don't know. Like this is because like that I, I like it almost feels like that must mean something suspicious yeah like or perceived sub- suspicious about Hagrid like I don't really like Filch or Mrs. Norris but like <laughs> and for that matter I love Hagrid but I, I can't really figure out like why that would happen like, well I guess they I mean the I mean we the Hagrid is assumed to have opened the Chamber of Secrets true and, like the teachers I guess would know that like why he was expelled. So I suppose Filch could just be like openly um, like perceiving his his presence at the school as like a like like an attack on the rules of the school. Maybe sure. Like, I mean he should have been expelled and, and like gone for that instead of like immediately being hired on as like an employee with yeah. keys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Boy, Dumbledore is hiring of Hagrid. Just, I mean, I love Hagrid, and clearly Dumbledore is right about it. But like, what he must have said, uh, what what he must have said to Armando Dippet. It's like, oh yeah, moaning Mur- Myrtle. She Myrtle Warren's dead, and uh, we're we're pretty much uh, that the, the best student ever. You know, Tom Riddle. He found the murderer. Yeah, yeah he yeah. found it's Hagrid. We found the monster. It's definitely him. Um, hear me out. We hire him, and I know he murdered someone, but what if we give him... Allegedly. Allegedly give him keys to every door in the castle? Just... We'll call him the keeper of the keys. It'll be fine. It'll it's be fine. fine. Yeah, it's a safe role. It's, it's a, safe, a role. safe role for this possible murderer. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't know how. I don't know how he was able to successfully pull that off. It yeah. seems like it must have been a pretty great challenge. But yeah. I, I, but either way, we know that Dumbledore is right, and Hagrid is kind-hearted, and, and and Mrs. Norris has has got nothing to go off of here. Nothing. Nothing whatsoever. Uh, as we as we move down a little bit, we get a reference to um, Ron's brother Charlie. Oh uh, yeah, which is kind of interesting because I feel like he. he He's largely brought up more in the first book, and then for the most part, it feels like Bill sort of takes over as like chief oldest brother, chief oldest brother. Yeah, you know, no for, doubt for the rest of the story. So we get yeah, a little he's bit a more goblet a little bit. We do get a little bit of Charlie. But, yeah, but really, I, I I feel like we spend more time with Bill. But maybe it's just because when you get to the end of the series, you've just spent more time with Bill. Well, Charlie's not in the movies at all either. Like no, Bill yeah. is in the movies, but Charlie isn't. Right, which right. is like a why not kind of thing. Yeah, I have no but, idea. It's kind of an unusual one. Yeah. Um. So that that's sort of that's sort of interesting. There's also this sort of weird thing where that keeps like sort of alluding to the fact that Hagrid knows something about why, why Snape doesn't like Harry and it's like I I don't think Hagrid does know why Snape doesn't like Harry. <laughs> does I, he <laughs> at the very least Hagrid would have probably known Hagrid would have been there at, as a school staffer while both Snape and James attended. True. So I, I think it's very possible that what Hagrid is not telling Harry is the history between James and mm. um, mm. and Snape. That that yeah. would be like my. I best guess bet. so. Yeah, I guess that's so, about as much as he can know. Because if you were if you were Hagrid and like witnessed all that and you had a closer relationship with James, but you also kind of I mean James is a jerk in high school. So yeah, like, I guess at this point, yeah, Hagrid's been like nicer people you couldn't have found uh, except right. except for except for Snape. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that would probably be my best bet is that Hagrid doesn't know the full story, but he knows just enough to know like. Eh, you're probably fighting an uphill battle on that one. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I don't really want to like sully, you know, your uh, dead father's name, you know, yeah. by, by telling you like, by the way, your dad was kind of a jerk to him. So like, you know, Snape, Snape not, he doesn't have a lot of ground to stand on, but like probably more than none. You yeah, know? more than none, specifically um, against your dad. Right, right. Um, as we as we took forward, though, we learned more about the, the Gringotts break in, which of course happened the same day that Harry and Hagrid uh, were at uh, Gringotts Bank. Um, one of my f- just favorite things is at the end of this like little n- little news clipping that Hagrid has is just that they specifically refer to the the person who gave uh, you know the the account of what happened as a spokes goblin. Yeah, I, like, <laughs> I, I love that. Yeah, yeah, like not a spokesman, a spokes goblin. A spokes goblin. Yeah, get it right. Um, I think that's pretty that's pretty fun and clever. Um, this is this is sort of interesting because it's like it's like the first piece of you know like the puzzle a little bit to where like they're starting to realize like wait a second I was there that day Hagrid handled that package like, right 
they're they're starting to get like I mean, we emptied a vault. <laughs> right, right, right. Like you know, this is this is where like you know Harry kind of becomes a little bit of like Encyclopedia Brown. Yeah, he starts will. being Detective Harry. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Starting to starting to try to like pull the pull the pieces of the overall the overall like story together. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Let's see. And that's that's pretty much that's mostly what happens for uh, chapter eight. Yes. Yeah. Um, but the I mean, potions yeah, master the potions master. It's a it's a fun chapter overall. I mean, you know, I think Harry just sort of like attending school as usual, like experiencing the wizarding world. I I often say that I feel like, um, you know, Goblet of Fire, I think is, is is has always historically been one of my favorite books in the saga. And I think a huge reason for that is because it's still like Harry is still like being immersed more and more in the wizarding world. Like he's still being exposed to like brand new things for the first time. And I feel like that, that largely continues all the way from books one through four. And then like once he's up to like year five, it's almost like Harry's pretty well acclimated to the wizarding world. Like, you know, it's you're, you're having less of like this, like awestruck looking around like, wow, this place is amazing. And magic is so cool. Like, right. You know, it's like at that point in time, it's more like, okay, he's in it now. Like, yeah, he's, we he's, get it. He's a pretty seasoned wizard. Um, um, so, you know, I feel like this is just like one of those good chapters where you're just sort of like seeing Harry do school and enjoy school. Hogwarts. Yeah. yeah. Even though it's it kind of sounds like all of his teachers kind of suck. I know. <laughs> Who was a good teacher here? Flitwick, Sprout, McGonagall. Sounds yeah. about right. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. sounds about right. Yeah. As, as we go. everything would, would press forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, that'll round us off for chapter eight. What do you think about the chapter art here? Okay, I actually had thoughts about the chapter art on this one because with the it's called the potions master. We don't spend like a specific. It's almost like it. The fact that this is a chapter where it's called the potions master, but not like and you do spend the most amount of time in Snape's class, but you could have just called it like week one. And the fact that it's called the potion master like helps draw your attention specifically to the interaction with Snape and that he's important, but the artwork itself is just a spell book and it's called the potions master. So it was like part of me is like wondering like is is the spell book in question up there like like the it, the copy of advanced potion making or something like oh. is it like it's called the potions master picture of book like is this like it doesn't have any is not a picture of Snape you know that's a why good isn't point. it a picture of Snape <laughs> or a cauldron or a cauldron or anything to do with potions. It's like it must be a potions book, but there is a very specific potions book that is uh, really important to the whole story. So I don't it doesn't feel like the sort of information that would have been given out um, after book one like oh yeah, make this a book because the sixth book's going to be about a book. You oh, know? Right, 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 but right. Yeah, like which represent you know, which is the, the half blood prince. Yeah, um, I know. Yeah, so it's, it's hard to know whether or not there would be like that much forethought, but it does seem like a it seems like a strange choice. Yeah, um, but the other thing to it and, and probably to your point is that like you're you're attempting to sh- really start shining the spotlight on Snape at this point in the story like because what we know is that he's going to be the red herring for the whole freaking story. Yeah, like it, like it, we're we are pretty much suspecting Snape as like you know person number one person number one suspect number one. the whole time. Yeah, I mean even like I mean, Harry outright says like, "Why did Snape hate him so much?" And I literally wrote the note like, yeah, "Only seven books to go." <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah, that's yeah. the other thing too. Is yeah, I, and I wrote this on the last page. I just said like this. We get the introduction to the mystery. Like, why does Snape hate Harry? So like a lot of these mysteries, I do remember experiencing them for the first time and just desperately wanting the answer because at this point in the story, you you do not have enough information to go off of to be able to like be like, oh oh yeah, Snape was in. Love with Harry's mother, like, it's yeah. like there's no way you could have ever deduced that out at this stage. Um, so yeah, that's I, I do think that the, you know it's 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 really the ignition point for what will go on to be a seven book long mystery. Yeah. So there's that. Um, I've also got a review. Oh hey, okay, let's read it. All right, this is from Potter Girl thirteen. It says I didn't know I needed this podcast. I love this so much. I found out I'm pregnant with my first little before this released. It's so crazy to think about where I'll be when all of this is over. I have an almost four year old, maybe even more. Anyways, you guys have really helped me keep things off my mind with this and your YouTube channel. Thank you for all you do. Can't wait to see where this goes and what will come. Oh, that's so no. cool. It's actually really fun because literally as of. Recording um, 
today's episode is actually my daughter Addison's second birthday. Well, happy birthday, Addison. I know. Happy birthday, Addie. Um, Because I I have had a similar thought before. Like when we when we started like slating this all out and we realized like, you know, if we're doing a chapter a week and how many chapters do we have? It's like this is going to take a while. Yeah. um, You know, to to get all the way through the Mm -hmm. the whole saga and everything. So we, we have lots of runway left ahead of us, but it will be so fascinating to see like where everybody's lives are at, you know, by the time we we get to the end of it. I know. I know. It's, it's gonna like, be, yeah. And it, so, yeah, it's like, yeah, like roughly four years from now. So, like, how old will my kids be? Like, nine, ten for Luke? Like, ugh, oh, man. That's crazy to think about. That is wild. That yeah. That is absolutely wild. Mm-hmm. But, but also very exciting. Yeah, I very know. Exciting. I'm like, I can't have a, yeah. I can't have a nine year old. Are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> like, it feels like he was just born. It does feel that way. It yeah. does feel that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, guys, that is chapter eight for you from Philosopher's Stone. Uh, if you would like to leave us a review, we would greatly appreciate it. It certainly helps, you know, with the discoverability of the podcast as it exists out there in the pod sphere. Uh, plus, there's a good opportunity for us to potentially read it here in one of the future episodes. So Absolutely. Be sure to go and leave a five star and a review. Um, but I think that's all for today. Yeah. Otherwise, join us next time through the Gryffindor. Welcome, dear listeners. I'm Jonathan Carlin. And I'm Ben Carlin. And we invite you to join us through the Gryffindor, your one-way ticket to the enchanting world of Harry Potter. So grab your wands, dust off your broomsticks, and join us as we unlock the secrets behind Philosopher's Stone, Chapter 9, The Midnight Duel. Ooh, the midnight duel. Of, Of the chapters or sequences from the first book, which probably somehow I have actually read the fewest number of times. Really? I suspect out of the whole series. Like when you restart, you're just like, "Eh, skip to two. Sometimes I'll skip to, sometimes I'll skip to two. A lot of times I'll just start with Goblet because that that has historically (laughs) been my favorite. And I'm like, yeah, you know, like, let's just get the gist of it. (laughs) We'll we'll get right into the full swing of like Voldemort's return and everything that comes, Mm -hmm. you know, in the wake of it. Yeah. Um, But this is the Midnight Duel is one of those scenes that is just completely left out of the film. Um, and the midnight duel is yeah, but they yeah. do go out and like find fluffy. They do go out and find yeah. fluffy. Yeah. So yeah. So this is the, the chapter where yeah, the, the Harry um, has flying lessons. He catches the remember all. He makes the Quidditch team and then uh, Draco challenges him to a, a midnight duel and he accepts and then they go do that and Draco doesn't show up, but they find fluffy. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Kind of interesting. The fact that um, this, is, this is almost like the last chapter of the potions master where um, like the the chapter title is the midnight duel which is sort of the catalyst for a lot of the events of the chapter however there is not actually a midnight duel yeah there isn't one yeah, yeah. there's like the there's the the challenge of the midnight duel but it does not come to pass it does not it does not so anyway let's let's go ahead and dive right on in and we'll, we'll just kind of go through as we always do as we and do. sort of uh, figure out what happens and what stood out to us as the chapter unfolds i know well right away the first sentence i love that harry is just like what what is it like out of the furnace and into the fire when it comes to like <laughs> dudley and draco uh, it, it really is <laughs> the case i mean yeah draco could not be even down to the the fact that they're like both like d names oh feels d like names and like the 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 favorite only you know the spoiled only child yes of people who dislike harry right right and it's yeah. it's remarkable that like literally it's like for harry it's like how could you know something have to deal with dudley again ever again and then it's like oh man right like now there's this guy yeah you know in in my new world that i love so much um yeah so that's that's pretty unfortunate for harry um one of the other things just on that exact note that i think is particularly interesting is that uh this chapter in particular i think really 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 starts to ramp up this idea or constant looming threat of harry's expulsion from hogwarts yeah. which as a kid i remember thinking was like like this really weighed on me super heavy like the, oh, the really? constant yeah like, i was always like Goodness gracious, like what they were able to establish in terms of what life is like for Harry at the Dursleys and the fact that he miraculously was able to escape that life and go live a better life. And then the, the fact that like it feels like that that knowledge is sort of constantly being used against you where it's like like expulsion on some level like, you know, would, would never be a good thing, and especially as like a student. The idea of getting like suspended from school always yeah. seemed like like a really 
ominous thing to have happened. It's yeah. like the equivalent of, of getting like a jail sentence, but for like an elementary school kid or something, it was like, like yeah. if you were suspended, it was like, cause any kid would rather like, you know, stay home and go to school. Like, I mean, going to school. Oh, usually. I know. I always thought I remember there was, the, I think in my entire like elementary school career, there was like one kid who ever got expelled for anything and he was out of school for a week. And the, I remember the whole week just being like, I mean, he didn't have to come to school. I, I know, know, but like, it was, it's weird that the punishment is that I feel like I was always so astutely aware of how upset mom and dad would be and if I if I was suspended it was like life at home is going to be way harder. oh I mean like, that's the truth of the situation but right. as the students who still have to go to school you're like oh if anything they've got it good over there right like they misbehave now they don't be. yeah anyway so but it comes up several times throughout the chapter so that was that was like one of the one of my uh, closing thoughts was I was like okay they really start to like scale up this particular this like threat oh, yeah the books would have you believe that the uh, every student in Hogwarts is basically like inching their way uh, next to the, the the edge of a cliff and at any moment might be expelled for any reason at all. Well, this is this is almost how like the wizarding world works as well, where it's like the fact that like any crime sends you to Azkaban. Oh, I know it's, like, it's such a harsh punishment for any crime at all. And and so it's like it, it is interesting, like in a, in a school that is like known to be filled with calamity, like where the, the Weasley twins have managed to like successfully make it through this many years of. Oh, of I education. know that's the like, other thing. It's like it's not really on the table. The other thing is like I, you have to admire Harry, like 11 year old Harry's humility in the situation, because like if he if he could like step back for like just a second and think about his own situation, like like if he if he knew more about his own situation, like he is under zero threat of being expelled. Like Dumbledore is not letting this kid go at all. Yeah, hundred you know? percent. No. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like if if he had any idea how important he was to the not just not just to the overall equation, but even just to Dumbledore as like an individual. Um, yeah, there's there's no way in the world. There's no way in the world. But either way, it comes up several times in this chapter, and that was something that I thought was that was kind of remarkable um, because there are <laughs> there are a multitude of different ways that they think they can be expelled just in this chapter alone. Oh, I know. Um, um, so even at the bottom of the first page here, there's the, this introduction to the idea that like uh, or, uh, Malfoy is talking about how good he is at Quidditch and he said Ron says anyway, I know Malfoy is always going on about how good he is at Quidditch, but I bet that's all talk, but it's not which there's this like sort of running trend where it's like Malfoy seems like this annoying obstacle all the time, but it's like he's not like incapable like he is a capable opponent and he is frequently getting things done. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think because it, like a lot of times it comes through the lens of him being such a jerk and such a bully, that, right? Like a lot of times you think that like this is your classic high schooler that's like being mean because he's otherwise compensating for something. But as we see with Malfoy as time goes on, it's like coming into this year, like part of his jealousy of Harry is literally going to spawn from the fact that what he expected for himself like potentially being like a like like first first year in a century to be selected for a Quidditch team like all things being equal like Malfoy probably had decent reason to believe that that could have been him. Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean if not for Harry Draco probably is like the most popular kid that year that year. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. he's very well liked by the other Slytherins and he is good at other things and he's even really good at school. Like I mean, like Harry and Ron squeak into Slughorn's um, class in sixth year. Oh yeah, because like, he doesn't require like an outstanding on the right. WL. So but yeah. like Draco just got in. He just got in, and yeah. he's also actively practicing like you know legitimacy uh, throughout you know the whole year against or occlumency. Occ occlumency, rather, yeah. yeah, against Snape. You know, which is the thing that like Harry can't grasp to save his life. You know, he's like fixing the vanishing cabinet. Like, yeah, people don't give Malfoy. I don't think enough credit for just being an right. otherwise like. I mean, he's a pain. Oh, I mean, he's an absolute pain, an absolute jerk. But I think people like it's easy to like rope him in with a like crab and goyle is like he's like annoying and he has resources but he's not actually very good at the stuff but like he is good at the stuff he is good at the stuff yeah. for sure um one of, one of the huge ironies though uh that we that we see inside of this chapter is that like really draco is kind of his own worst enemy when it comes to this whole quidditch thing because <laughs> if if not for his like sort of jerk move and picking on neville and and stealing the remember all like then harry doesn't he, he's not able to display his you know 
instinctive abilities on a broomstick. Dude, and I, yeah, my note at the end of this chapter was Malfoy keeps accidentally advancing the plot for Harry. Yes, where, yeah, yeah like, absolutely. Yeah, he takes the remember all. Harry gets on the Quidditch team. He challenges him to the midnight duel. Harry finds the trap door. <laughs> even like, yeah, even the fact that like um, from the very beginning that like Draco was one of the first fellow students that he ever met and and sort of like brought about this like negativity attached to the name of Slytherin House. Like even that, it's like like Draco was sort of like dictating some of like how Harry responds to what he. Oh, seeing. I know. There's like there's like a certain amount of like Draco is Voldemort's worst enemy and has no idea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah, exactly. No, that's that would be a hilarious plot line to tug on. Is sort yeah. of like like if anything, I think Malfoy keeps getting in the way of like what you know. If Harry gets to Hogwarts and has no idea about any of this stuff, you know, like there's a very real chance he just ends up in, in Slytherin just ends up in Slytherin right yeah, yeah where, where he if although that would even suck for Malfoy because if he became Slytherin's seeker then that would mean Draco doesn't make the team as seeker you know well I, it would but it's like I wonder if Draco would have cared it's like I think Draco wants to be the Slytherin seeker because Harry is the Gryffindor seeker so he wants to be able you know. to go toe to toe with him right so because he wants to prove that he's better than him but if Harry if they were in the same house and Harry was already the seeker I imagine Malfoy would still want to be on on the team just That's as a different you know different position. position. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. And we do know from Ginny that you can play more than one position pretty easily or or at least possibly. Yeah, yeah. 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 you can you can transfer transferable skills. Yes, yes, know? of course. Um, we, we did sort of uh, we, we jumped around a little bit here, um, but like a couple of things I thought were particularly interesting um, is the well, a piece of trivia that I that I just highlighted is that Dean's poster is of West Ham soccer team. Yep. Um, one of the things that that was sort of just mildly interesting and I'd be curious if like other copies of the book read it as football team um, just because this is like a UK based public, you know, uh, Oh, you're right, but it does use the word soccer. Oh, yeah, we do have like the Sorcerer Stone version of the book, so I do wonder if it says football. The next sentence after that says Ron couldn't see what was exciting about a game with only one ball where no one was allowed to fly and I'm like I'm reading that and like there is a chance to me that it 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 reads as if Ron has never heard of soccer. (laughs) That is how I would interpret it. Okay, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's like, I, I, like, or is he coming into the argument like, oh, Dean, 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 Dean. We're not putting that poster up in here. Like, soccer? Are you kidding me? One ball? They don't fly? No. No, I yeah. think he doesn't understand this. This to me feels like the the inverse of sort of like, um, you know, like the fish out of water, uh, like yeah. like mechanism. I guess is that like normally Harry's a fish out of water because he's being just introduced to all things new. He's drinking from a fire hose in the Wizarding World. Like everything is new. But on the flip end of things, like soccer is one of the most popular sports on planet Earth. And so this is like one of those things where Ron has been isolated by the wizarding world and doesn't know it, which is bonkers, especially like in Britain where soccer is so big, not to mention with his dad being Arthur Weasley, almost certainly Quidditch is yeah. Arthur's second favorite sport. Oh, yeah, to, compared to, to compared yeah, to, but it's probably not even soccer for like Arthur. He probably likes like cricket or Something, yeah. some obscure <laughs> muggle sport. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like, Which, like uh, just I say that as an American, knowing full well that cricket is wildly popular in almost everywhere else. That, yeah, exactly. It's like so many people right now are like, "Why did you just like, choose, why did you cricket? choose like, cricket? What about, are you doing? How about American football, where it's played in America?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have other versions of it in Canada and Australia, but let's, but, but then also American football, so much fun. You guys see the Hokies last night? They stomp Syracuse. It was well, great. Yeah, totally stepping out of stepping. Yeah. Out out of the context of wow. our of our of our show here. I know. Like, yep. Sorry about that. We'll get, we'll get back to back to this now. Okay, but I thought that was funny because literally yesterday I had a message on Instagram where someone was um, like complaining that like he, there was no way the Harry Potter books actually took place in the 90s because at no point in the books did someone did any of the characters say like, wow, can you believe the run the bulls are having right now? <laughs> it's like excellent point. Excellent point, but also Ron's never even heard of soccer, so, so I, I doubt they know about American basketball. I think we're clear. Yeah, yeah. They, they didn't know who Jordan was. Um, yeah. No, that's hilarious. But OK, so, yeah, so as we move on past the West Ham team, um, the other thing that I find to be kind of interesting is the way that Hermione sort of struggles uh, a little bit because oh, you, yes. you see the first time where um, like Quidditch is not something you can necessarily like like you can read about it in books, but like it's not something you can learn how to do from a book like it needs to be done 
through some level of like, you know, intuitive relationship with with the broomstick. Yeah, um, I mean, Harry is acting completely on instinct when he's on the broom. A hundred percent. I mean, he it technically is not the first time he's it's ever true. A broom, it's true. Um, because we know that Sirius gave him one as a for his first birthday that would hover like a thing like a foot off of the ground. Yeah, um, but like clearly Harry has some like instinctive abilities when it comes to to comes to flying, but um, it is always interesting to me because the other one that that I think this also ends up being true for where instincts sort of outplay um, what you can learn out of a textbook is that Harry does outdo Hermione in defense against the dark arts. Yeah, so it's it the, does tie in there too. It's the one subject that he's able to sort of like edge her out on. Um, so I, it's just kind of interesting that this is like also true for this particular other activity that Harry also happens to excel at. Yes, it does. So it's like no coincidence though. Um, I also love when I love when the um, the male gets there this uh, when Neville gets the remember all in this one. There's a few things that I like about this little little section here is one that uh, it says Harry hadn't had a single letter since Hagrid's note something that Malfoy had been quick to notice which <laughs> is just like dude Draco. How obsessed are you with Harry? Oh my god like every morning you're like did Potter get something Potter did you get any mail? Get any mail? He, he, he didn't get any mail right? You, I'm, I got, I got I'm got looking. Some. I'm watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna make sure that I'm getting more mail than him. Honestly, it reminds me a lot of uh, in Deathly Hallows. Harry ends up having this like a like weird obsession with Stan Sean Pike being yeah. like the one who's like <laughs> being you know um, manipulated into being a Death Eater and like it just keeps coming back to Stan and I'm like Harry. I don't think Stan was like a great dude who's like being like seduced to the dark side. I mean he he's under the Imperius curse like he's not actually a death eater. Yeah, but it's also like is Stan the hill that we're dying on over apparently here? he is the hill that yeah. they're dying on. Um, I also yeah. love that Malfoy gets packages of sweets from home uh, every uh, like almost on the daily. It sounds like because I'm just trying to imagine either Narcissa or Lucius like packing him a basket of treats, you know, <laughs> and I'm like it's like in my mind, like you'd love to think that most in most cases, this is just like a mom being like, oh, you know, he's probably homesick. I'm sending him some treats to make him feel good. But like in my mind, Narcissa is packing this basket solely with the intent that like when this lands, the other students will know Draco's better than them. I think that's exactly. Yeah, I mean, her name is Narcissa. Yeah, that's true. Like, I mean, it's not that <laughs> far off. From, yeah, from narcissist. So I think 100 percent. She's just literally trying to ensure that everybody knows that like her son is getting Getting like even even more right than the rest of them. Yeah, uh, to like I mean almost to a fault because I mean on some level you could probably just send enough treats for a week and not send an owl daily. Oh, I know it's absolutely crazy. Um, then just a few lines down, there's uh, when Neville gets to remember all like there's uh, never was trying to remember what he'd forgotten. I love that. It seems like the obvious problem with the remember all like how does it ever going to help you do anything? But in the movies, there's like a very like just neat like eagle eye thing you can notice where um, like if you look at Neville's surroundings as he picks up the remember all it turns red and it's like the thing he has forgotten is his robes like all the other students are wearing robes, but he is not. Oh, I've like, never caught that before. Yeah, so that's that is so the thing clever. he's forgotten in the movie, which I always think is really fun. Nope, that's perfect. That's yep. perfect. Okay. But then it also says when it, when Malfoy comes over to like take it from Neville, it's like it says who was passing by the Gryffindor, Gryffindor table and it's like again Malfoy stop being so obsessed because they have laid out for you how the tables are Ours. arranged and there is just no reason at all for Draco to be meandering over towards the Gryffindor table. It's like it's at all. He's gone drastically yeah. out of his way and, and it's probably because he's not paying attention to his own owls arrival and he's literally just watching what's happening amongst the other first year Gryffindor boys and yeah. he's gone far out of his way to go and be a menace <laughs> which like that's like one of those things where it says like um, like McGonagall who could spot trouble quicker than any teacher in the school was there in a flash. It's like no I bet what McGonagall saw was Draco walking across the entire great uh, I know like, to go well, in. there's just no reason for him to be it's there. Like, it's like there is like guaranteed this is this is just to cause yeah. trouble. So anyway, as we scoot forward, though, uh, there is a, just an interesting like little detail that I think helps give us some contextualization. Wow, I don't know why I said context context as to how many students uh, are in each class. Yes, so we've always known. Did you pick up on this? Too? I did. I circled it. Yeah, okay. Um, so like one of the big things we've always been really curious about is it seems like there's shockingly few students at school. Um, basically, we know Harry is one of five um, boys in the Gryffindor common room. He's, of course, there with Ron Neville Dean and Seamus um, Hermione is <laughs> not that he's always 
is aware of that. I'm going to point out for later in the chapter. <laughs> sure, that's a, that's yeah. a good point. Yeah. Um, but uh, the other is that we know that Hermione knows Lavender Brown and Parvati Patil yeah. as the other two first year Gryffindors, and then there are somehow two, possibly two other unnamed Gryffindor uh, girls. girls that we just never we never get an intro to, which seems shocking. It kind of does. Like like how how could they have no role in anything? ever at all or else it's just those three and the Slytherin first year is vastly outnumber the Gryffindors which is possible but yeah so the line that, that Jay and I both caught on to here is that the Slytherins were already there this is for flying lessons and it says and so were 20 broomsticks lying in neat lines on the ground so what we've always sort of extrapolated and, and this is based on minimal evidence but it's essentially that let's say that there are five boys in the Gryffindor five girls in Gryffindor five boys in Slytherin five girls in Slytherin 20 broomsticks total yeah you know and then approximately when you end up with is 40 new students per year, 280 students total that attend Hogwarts at once. Um, as we pointed out, though, there is a chance that numbers are overall down during these particular years because these are the students who would have reached age 11 uh, sort of in the wake of Voldemort's peak to power. Right. You know, so it's, it's entirely possible that that families were um, not having kids because of their other eyes um, to uh, afraid of what was going on and not wanting to bring children into a world where, you know, somebody like that was, was at rule yeah. uh, or potentially going to seize rule, um, you know, or the other is, you know, just simply quite literally fighting in the fight against. Oh Baltimore. yeah. Or they were just being killed, right? Exactly, it actually, yeah. it would almost make sense for there to be more Slytherin kids in that a way, little bit. in yeah. that way it would make sense. Yeah. yeah. So I like could, they would have felt maybe the safest during that time, right? So yeah. I, I don't, I don't have an issue assuming that there are 12 Slytherins here and eight Gryffindor. Sure. I mean, I mean, you, we know Draco, Crab, Goyle, and Blaze are four of the Slytherin boys, and then yes. we know just of Pansy Parkinson, I think, and Millicent Bolstrode of the girls. I think you're right. Yeah, I don't, um, there might be more known ones, but those are the ones that come to mind. <laughs> Speaking of Pansy, there was a detail. I don't know if you caught this one or not um, that I thought was kind of interesting, but uh, Pansy Parkinson famously throughout the entire story will always, always, always refer to um, Hermione as her last name of Granger. However, on the, the very next page, uh, Pansy does get like her first speaking lines, I believe, and says, ooh, sticking up for Longbottom. Um, a hard faced Slytherin girl said never thought you'd like fat little crybabies Parvati um, and so she refers to Parvati by her first name. Mm. That's like one of those things where it's like is there a chance that the uh, Patil twins would have grown up close to or in proximity to uh, Pansy. I actually wrote that down too. I said did they know each other. <laughs> yeah like, like, like yeah I mean because even even the Patil twins are sorted into different houses so but if, they've all got that like um, alliterative P name as well. They randomly. do. Yeah yeah. yeah. And, and so this is this is like one of those things where like, you know, we know that prior to age 11 uh, wizarding kids, you know, are not um, they're not attending like a formalized school system. They're just educated by their parents. Um, but it's not to say that like a lot of the wizarding families wouldn't just simply know one another and have their kids spending time. So that's like a really, really, really interesting like sleight of hand. I feel like that almost suggests like these these girls grew up. Yeah. knowing each other. Well, but then bit. I think all, that might even continue to track because I think in order of the Phoenix, the Patil's parents are thinking of taking them out of school. That is true. So they might be more like on the ministry side of things. They very well could be. Ooh, that's, that is interesting. That's a yeah. good point. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And, and and that being said, um, you know, uh, Parvati and Lavender end up being, of course, best friends as Gryffindors, but they, they can be a little bit at times shallow. It yeah. feels um, like, you know, they, they sort of get like ultra enamored with like divination and, you know, like yeah. they're they're um, um, you know, I guess Parvati has a little bit of a crush on Harry as of fourth year, and and you know, it, of course, attends the Yule Ball with him. Um, and it's it's like, is that like was it because like Harry's like a, like a school champion, you know? And it's like mm -hmm, a little mm -hmm. bit of, a little bit of social hierarchy, a little bit. Yeah, um, I mean, and then I think um, I think Seamus refers to Parvati and Padma as like the best looking girls in the class or something. Yes, yeah, he yeah, is, yeah. So yeah. I mean, they're like she's like a popular girl. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, basically yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, but I also this is uh, that said, this was a great chapter for. Parvati, which I've never really noticed before, like when uh, Malfoy starts, he says, did you see it? Did you see his face? The great lump and the other Slytherins start laughing and, and Parvati is the one who speaks up and says, shut up Malfoy. Oh, I was no, like, yeah. oh, good for you Parvati. Look at you. Don't you don't see Parvati do a lot of standing up to anyone for most of the book. I mean, she's in the DA later right, on. Yes, yeah, yeah. So there is like that, but like this is like a uh, a, like a, a nice tiny little character moment for her and I think she has another one later on in the chapter as well. 
Um, we'll see if I can find it again as we as we keep moving. Yeah. Well, speaking of uh, tiny character roles, let's talk about Madam Hooch for just one hot second, who clearly has just got the most choice position at Hogwarts. School oh, my gosh. Of anybody, because near as we know, like flying lessons are like a really big deal. And, and I suppose it's possible that like they have other flying lessons that they just don't tell us about. But as far as we know, this is the only one they ever have and beyond this the only other thing that we know madam hooch to do for the school at all is referee the quidditch matches right. which you know each team plays three games total per season like it, I, I, this is like one of those like my, my brain can never math correctly but four teams that all play each other does that end up accumulating I think it's it? six games total okay yeah. yeah so it's like it's not a terribly busy schedule yeah right you know it's not like, even like she's like running the quidditch tryouts or overseeing practices or something like maybe, maybe she has to like keep track of the schedule when the captains schedule it or something. I don't know. Possibly. Yeah. Like, but it, it feels like one of these things where like maybe she's just like a resident of Hogsmeade and just sort of like, you know, volunteers at the school because she was maybe like a former, you know, uh, holy head harpy or something like that. You know, yeah. like like she she was a she was like a like a, quid, a famous Quidditch player once upon a time is is, you know, fierce and tough and stuff like that. But like pretty much, you know, just comes in, helps out with Quidditch stuff, helps out the Quidditch stuff. But like I think even later in this book, she like Snape replaces her as the referee for one of the Quidditch matches. You might be which right. Which is kind yeah. of like, oh, I didn't know Snape was so good on a broom. That yeah. is always kind a of a little surprising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like that. That's like one of those where I feel like there could be like a training montage in like a Marauder series where like Snape, because I mean, Snape is not exactly regarded in the, any of the flashbacks as being particularly athletic. So it's like, is it possible that like what you would see if you were watching a Marauder series and, and uh, you know, James and, and the rest of them going through their years at quit uh, uh, at Hogwarts rather um, like if Snape would be like working really hard to actually like overcome what might be like um, some some skill deficiencies in the in the the world of, of flying and like yeah. actually like grows to be good at it somehow. I, I mean, I can see him like privately training himself to be good at Quidditch just because of how jealous he is of James. Yes. Yeah, almost yeah. almost certainly. And I mean, he does fly a broom in the Battle of the Seven Potters pretty effectively. That's true. So it's like he can do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. almost certainly at some point in time he becomes proficient. We, we yeah. don't actually know for sure that he ever wasn't, but that's just sort of asserting on the basis of, of James being your classic kind of um, like jock you yeah. know, from high school and Snape being more of like your stereotypical like like um, like bookhead or something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, but anyway, uh, yeah. So on, on the note of Madame Pooch a little bit there, there's kind of a, like a nice sentimental moment, I guess, if you, if you want to call it that, where she seems pretty tough, you know, like, what are you all waiting for? She barked, you know, and it's like, it's almost immediately like she's kind of got like a little bit of like intensity, but then Neville's, uh, broomstick, of course, sort of like goes rocketing off the ground. Um, this is like one of those things in the movie that I actually feel like I would argue was not a detail that was like well executed. Um, Neville is sort of like klutzy on his own, but in the film, when Neville's broom goes up in the air, it's almost bucking him in the same way that Harry's broom is bucking him. Oh, the sure. First match. Yeah. The only like big thing about that is that like we know why Harry's broom was bucking him. Like, right. It's specifically because Quirrell is there like actively trying to hurt him while he's on the broom. Like Harry hasn't like lost control, you know, but like when they show it like Neville doing the same thing, it's like you might just be under the impression like, oh, brooms just do that. Yeah. You know, like that might just yeah. be a like, characteristic. Of Whereas, yeah, here in the book, he like shoots up in the air and then it's like, oh, and just sort of like slumps off kind of kind of almost immediately falls off. But anyway, so that's the thing, um, you know, uh, she Neville falls to the ground. She immediately comes over, assesses the broken wrist. Um, and I think that like, you know, she she then like walks away um, with Madame Hooch who had her arm around him. So it's like for someone who was otherwise kind of like fierce, you mm-hmm. know, it seems like with Madame Hooch, it's like a, she clearly cares for like a, a student in need. Yeah, th- I mean, there is that. I also feel like that when I was reading this, I was like, it seems like this. She should have been prepared for almost this exact thing to happen you know like you have a bunch of first years who've never been on a broom before like certainly you're prepared for one of them to fall right from a great distance like what should you know this seems like the number one thing you should be looking out for it, do, it seems like there should be like a, yeah. like a spell cast across like the ground or something yeah like, and like you, the you can't the, go more than five feet or something exactly <laughs> yeah yeah and if you do fall it like will cushion your landing kind yeah. Of, yeah or like she, yeah I don't know or then even the <laughs> she just like Neville falls and she's like all right 
I'll leave you all here unattended with the brooms. <laughs> yeah, know? right. right. Like, like, I wrote yeah, right next yeah, to that. Yeah, <laughs> like not, uh, not, not a good call. Madam Pooch. not also, a great call. It, it seems like in every other occasion ever when somebody needs to be sent to the hospital wing, they're almost always sent off either on their own, which I think Neville was literally in the last chapter when he spilled potions on himself <laughs> or another student guides them up to the hospital. Yeah, wing. so it's like the fact that the teacher's taking him is kind of like is that yeah. really necessary, but yeah, maybe because right. she's not a real teacher. She's just a volunteer, just a volunteer. There you go. But yeah. then um, let's see. No, never mind. Okay, never mind. We'll come back to it. Okay, let's yep, see. No yeah, Malfoy goes into the air. He throws the remember all Harry realizes he's immediately good at flying and catches it and then McGonagall sees him and she comes out and she's like, how dare you might have broken your neck. Yeah, yeah so I'm, <laughs> I'm almost surprised. She's like so mad at him when she's there to I like, think she's putting on a front. Oh, you think she's like Th- that's my thinking oh. here because I think McGonagall has such a soft spot for Quidditch. Yeah, like this is like one of those things where I think I think in this I think she's normally very stern um, as like a resting demeanor, but I think in this particular instance she knows that what the rest of the students need to see is sternness like that's that's my read on the situation like she's almost like well I can't go out there and just be like well done Potter yeah you know like, like, like that like that sends a bad message to the rest of the kids it's like they, they need to think that he's being punished for exactly what's about to yeah. happen here but guess um, who speaks up who speaks it's up Parvati is it Parvati yeah. there we go that's your moment She says it wasn't his fault professor and she says be quiet Miss Patil and I'm like oh, she's the first one to speak up for Harry way to go Parvati I know way, way to, to go, go. This yeah. is probably your best chapter she does <laughs> she, she does start strong there's one thing we, we just glided over real quick that I just want to touch on oh, real yeah, fast. Yeah, just yeah. simply because it, it comes up later but um, Harry's first moment um, you know uh, coming off the ground on the broom uh, it says in a rush of fierce joy he realized he would found something he could do without being taught this was easy this was wonderful mm-hmm. um, the only reason I bring it up it's just this is the memory Harry goes back to when first trying to cast a Patronus. Oh, um, you're right. Yeah, so this is that, that's just like sort of like a notable like, you know, that that means that like in this moment, like this is like one of the best things that's ever happened to Harry before. Right. Absolutely. You know, even more so than Hagrid's arrival or going to Gringotts or getting his wand or meeting right, like Ron being like, on a broom. Yeah, being on a it's broom. It's like the amount to which Quidditch is important to Harry is like one of those things that like very much think it's like glossed over in the movies. He's sort of like just on the team in the movies, but like his motivation for like even learning to Patronus, it's not because he's like cares about defeating Dementors or doesn't like them or something. It's like it's so he can play Quidditch. Yes, like that yeah, is yeah. his primary motivation. Like when he's when he's dating Cho, like with the only thing he knows to talk about. Yeah, let's talk about Quidditch. Yeah, but you know, this, yeah. Is like, this is like my, this is my thing. Basically, this is it. This is it's, yeah. it's that and defeating Dark Lords. That's it. That's what, what I What would do. you like to choose? Your, yeah. your boyfriend was killed by one of them. Okay, so well, Quidditch it is so Quidditch it is. And then she's like, no, actually, I really want to talk about that first one. <sighs> like but. only that <laughs> that date is you probably well. need to talk about it too. Yeah, well, I mean, that's probably true. That he is probably, true. I mean, like, no, I've got Hermione <sighs> Harry. Come on, Harry dude. Oh man. <laughs> anyway, um, once again, so basically uh, as as Harry is being like carted away from all of his uh, fellow students there for catching the remember all he uh, we get the line. He was going to be expelled. He just knew it. So once again, you yeah, know, this the is threat, like the, the threat of expulsion is, is just kind of constantly looming over him. Uh, there's sort of a dark moment, if you will, um, where of course Harry thinks he, he, he's certain he's in trouble. Professor McGonagall goes um, to Professor Flitwick's class and says, could I borrow wood for a moment? moment would thought Harry bewildered it was wood a cane she was going to use on him. I wrote yikes. I know, that. Yeah, it's like what has happened like we never get any indication that the Dursleys have done anything physically harmful to Harry. Yeah, um, but like this is like one of those where it's like did the Dursleys do something physically harmful to Harry? I mean, Dudley had the smelting stick, you know. He did have the you smelting know, stick. Which is apparently given to students for the express purpose of hitting each other when the teachers weren't looking. Th- that is just the, that, I, that again, I think that's through the lens of Harry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that has to be the case. Anyway, so that, that's like one of those things where I was like, I read that line and I was like, I've never caught that before or it has never really stuck with me before, but I was like, man, that's that's a scary thing to think is about to happen certainly, to you certainly is the way Filch seems to treat the students as if that's like an actual punishment he's allowed to reach for yes yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. but again that, that goes back to Filch's whole thing where it's just sort of like it's like his whole embodiment is is like 
rule breaking or rule following to a fault. Yeah. So anyway, um, the description of wood I always think is fascinating because I've always loved the casting of wood in the um, in the films. I, I pretty much just like just make a fire beater. Make a fire beater. <laughs> yeah. Um, wood turned out uh, to be a person, a burly fifth year boy <laughs> who came out of Litwick's class looking confused. Um, now this is one. This is the, I just wanted to, <laughs> when when McGonagall gets wood from the class in the movies. He doesn't get him from Flitwick's. It's this is just one of those great moments in all the movies where she gets him from Quarles class. And this is where Quarles holding up the iguana for, for, <laughs> for, for, for just no reason. It's like iguanas are not magical. <laughs> they are like remarkably common creatures. Yeah. Um, no, I know that that is like one of our favorite scenes to, to throw to whenever we're talking about Quarrel. It's just like, why is he holding an iguana? I know. <laughs> Can you imagine what they were doing on set? It's like, so he'll be teaching class. Hold this. What? <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, sure. The iguana. Yeah. The kind. Of the small. The big one. The bi- the big one. Okay. 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 Yeah. Fun fact. I uh, my, my first job was working at a store called Petland. Yeah. And one of the things I worked in the the fish and reptile department, and uh, the storage container for the iguana tank was clear on the front, where con- where customers could come by and like you know peer in at the iguanas. But on the back end was just a bunch of locked doors in like the back room that yeah. like opened up to the other side, and it was the most terrifying thing in the world because you would go, you put the key in the door, and you would you would turn it to open it, and then like iguanas may or may not just jump on you yeah. because like you know they don't they're all of a sudden the door is opening and they're just like what's going on freedom yeah so the the number of times actually one iguana did cut, get out for a very long time and we didn't find it forever and when we did it was like five times the size Whoa. Of because it was like eating all of like the crickets and stuff that had jumped out that's it was hilarious pretty ridiculous anyway that's a so there was just like sort of a wild iguana roaming around the store if you ever go to a pet store you can almost be certain that somewhere hiding behind like the walls or tanks or pumps or something like that is 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 like a just is like a, a rogue snake or a, an iguana. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So just keep that in mind. Every okay. time going there. Cool. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Almost certainly the case. <laughs> <laughs> kind of terrifying. Awesome. Yeah. How fun is that? Anyway, so we can continue back on with the story. Um, let's see here. So um, we we definitely get like the the first introduction. I, it does surprise me when you know more about Oliver Wood as a captain of the Quidditch team. It seems surprising to me that he would be open to a scenario where McGonagall is simply telling him, I found you a seeker. This is going to be your player. Yeah, this is it. This is it. This is it. Um, but that being said, um, it you don't need to hold tryouts, which is also weird because later on, I think I think it's Katie Bell who tells Harry's like, no, you don't need to try out. You're on the team. And she's like, no, don't do that. Like right. everyone still has to try out. Plenty of people have plenty of teams have gone bad because they just keep hiring the old favor or, you know, the old players. Yeah, yeah, the old players. And it's like, meanwhile, and like you'd think that like Oliver Wood would believe that like to the core of his being like such a Quidditch player. Yes, you know, yes. like I'm absolutely having tryouts. Everyone's spot is up for grabs every single year, and yet he's just like, no, nah, I the basically the six six of us are here from last year, so we'll all be on the team. And McGonagall, you found this kid. I haven't seen him fly, but he's on. <laughs> You mean he's he's flown once? Cool, one time ever. Okay, we're gonna win. That's enough. Yeah, I, I, I'm certainly this is this is gonna be amazing. I do love his. Yeah, he does just immediately accept the the circumstances and says, "We'll have to get him a decent broom, Professor, a Nimbus two thousand or a clean sweep seven, I'd say. Which to me reads as like so presumptuous. Like what? I want to know the inner workings of like do why they're allowed to buy who is allowed to buy Harry a broom. Like does the school buy it for him? Does the Gryffindor Quidditch team have like a booster club or like do they have some amount of funds and they were like we're putting basically all those mo- all that money that we have into buying Harry a broom. I, this or, is it, it is it is kind of shocking because it is one of those things where it's like not only are they getting him a broom, but they're getting him like the newest and latest like a, like broom that there is. I know, but like if the school is capable of getting him a broom, then why don't all why doesn't the whole team have an 2000s. So the fact that different Quidditch players have different brooms is kind of one of those things that it's like it feels like they should have the same broom. Like it does this feels feel like, like, that. like you know in NASCAR for example, it's like one of the things you may or may not know. I don't know um, about like the sport of NASCAR is that they are all driving the exact same car with the exact same abilities and the idea is who can drive the exact same car the best, right? That's what 
stock car means. That is what stock car means. Yeah. yeah. So um, anyway, so I, I do feel like that's always been one of those things where it's like, like clearly as Harry becomes, you know, uh, a captain later, like he never refers to a situation and maybe it's because Ron has already like gotten a broom, but it never seems like Harry is like, oh yeah, Ron, don't worry, man. Like we'll get you a new Nimbus 2001. Like, you know, we'll yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or by that time, probably like a Nimbus 2005 or something. Um, anyway, but so the next line is I'll shall speak to Dumbledore and see if we can't bend the first year rule. Um, this is like one of those, those favorite fan theories that we've got about the story, but um, we, we will soon learn that uh, Harry is the youngest uh, Quidditch player for a school team in almost a century in almost a century, but guess who started? So it's 1991. Yes. In this in in uh, this school year as we're reading it. So one century ago would have been 1891, but uh, Dumbledore himself began attending the school in 1892. Yeah. So 99 years ago, basically uh, around a century, a century ago. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and we know that Dumbledore entered his first year and by the end of his first year was known as the most brilliant student ever and won every like award the school had to offer, which if that's true, it means that he would. I mean, by the time he finishes school or whatever, but it means he also would have had to have won the Quidditch Cup at um, least once wh- at least once while he was there and uh, we know that Dumbledore is like really into Quidditch like he keeps up with it as well like he's yes. like oh uh, he always knows how the Chudley cannons are doing or whatever. Yes, so yep. it seems like Dumbledore's in on it. We see him fly a broom as well when they're coming back from Madame Rose Murtis to go True. and it's like it even says like Dumbledore like lean down on the broom like he knows like he's good at it. Yeah, like he, yeah. He, he knows how to handle a broomstick. Yeah, so so and, yep. and the fact that it's literally just like I shall speak to Professor Dumbledore, see if we can't bend in the first year rule. It's like if anybody was going to allow, yeah. you know, somebody to do it, it would probably be going and asking the person who quite literally was the last exception to the rule. Exactly. So if you ever wondered who was the last first year in a century to make a Quidditch team, it was Dumbledore. That's our thought. At That's least. our thought. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. There we go. Um, but anyway, yeah, again, I, I this is like just one of those where I really do love how much McGonagall loves Quidditch herself. Um, yes. On that same note, like it seems like amongst the professors, like, you know, she says, like, I wasn't able to look Severus Snape in the, you know, the face for weeks after their last loss uh, to them. And this is like one of those things where it must be the case that like for the professors and heads of houses respectively, it must be like like Quidditch is still like a point of pride. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It is. I love um, she tells him your father would have been proud. He was an excellent Quidditch player himself, but I think it's interesting because you later see James like walk around the school and he has a golden snitch with him and catches it, but James was not a seeker. No, he was not. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, one of the other details that we'll eventually learn is that snitches are um, specifically crafted, you know, by uh, the maker who makes them like while wearing gloves because one of the um, things that snitches are capable of doing is providing like a flush memory to basically showcase like who was the first person to ever handle that particular snitch. Yeah, in the Um, case of like a, you know, people reaching for it, which to me, even when I think about it, doesn't even seem like it makes sense. Like it's perfectly possible that like the losing team's seeker like reached out and made a grab for a snitch and just missed that but true. like touched it. Yeah, like <laughs> touched know? it. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I don't I don't know that it perfectly holds up and it, it certainly never reads for the first six books of the series at any point in time as if they are not just reusing the same snitch. Yeah, but then like when Harry receives it, it it's almost as if like Dumbledore like left him a golf ball. You know, it's like yeah. a snitch. What is he doing? Giving me a like, you know, I mean, because that would be like, you know, your your you know loved one or whatever passing away and leaving you with a golf ball, and it would be like, you know, this is only cool if the golf ball is significant, you know. But yeah. Like, otherwise, like it's just a golf ball. Mm-hmm. You know, these are like readily common, you know, objects or whatever. So sometimes it does feel like that's that's like like the snitch ruling. It almost feels like it sort of gets developed a little bit as the story progresses. It does kind of feel that way. Um, yeah. No, no doubt as well. I love the bottom of this page where uh, Wood is talking to Harry and he says only don't tell him or um, blah, 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 or Harry uh, has been told by Oliver not to tell anyone. He's like he's talking to Ron and he says I start training next week. Only don't tell anyone Wood wants to keep it a secret and literally the next sentence is Fred and George came into the hallway. Wood just told us <laughs> <laughs> it's like Wood's already talking about it, man. At or I mean, he's still the other team, but like you know what? Well, I think it's like one person can keep a secret. Two can't, you know, oh, right, right, <laughs> yeah. right. Yep. Yep. Um, no, so that's that's amazing. Um, 
we get another reference to Charlie. You know, we, yep. we haven't once since Charlie left. So this is another one of those situations where I always feel like as the story progresses, Bill like really eclipses Charlie in terms of like Weasley family importance and involvement. Mm-hmm. Um, but Charlie in this first book especially seems to come up on numerous occasions. Yeah, because he has to get Norbert. They're like, uh, you know, that's that's his going to be his big role later in the book. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So yeah, and there's like a big reason why why Charlie will end up being super But so if, if they haven't once since Charlie left, how much older is he? Because they like... Ron is in his first year now and Charlie's been gone for I wonder he's the oldest Weasley brother so more than seven years I don't know do we know that, that Charlie's older than Bill oh maybe maybe that's not the case I don't Bill, know Bill I don't than know. Charlie yeah you're right you're right you're right, right. yeah I don't know that yeah. I don't know that Charlie is the oldest he may be the second um, but the the way that I've read it is almost on some level, like especially with the fact that McGonagall specifically says like Charlie Weasley himself couldn't have done it. Um, talking about uh, Harry's dive, it sort of reads to me as if like Oliver would have played with Charlie at some point. In time. Oh, like, right. So, he would have seen him. Yeah, yeah. Like so that that to me would almost suggest that like if if he's if Oliver is a fifth year and Harry's the youngest, it means the earliest Oliver could have started is his second year, which would have been three years prior. Right. Which means that some and if if uh, Slytherin flattened them last year, then it means that Charlie has at least been out for one season. Right. So I would say that it seems like Charlie's maybe like two years out of school, but sure. like that might be like something that's still like you m- might just need like more information overall. Um, and I've never paid close enough attention to it. I, I have always sort of assumed that Charlie was like quite a bit older, but I'm, I, don't, I just don't know. Yeah. Well, no matter what, he's got to be at least by even your own math. They're still eight years older than Ron. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true because they wouldn't have they wouldn't have overlapped. Yeah, they don't overlap at Hogwarts at, at all. all. Yeah. And at least one year on top of that. But right. Yeah. Right. Um, anyway, moving on. Uh, they talk. So Fred and George exit this and they say uh, Lee Jordan reckons he found the new secret passageway out of the school, but it's that one behind the statue of Gregory the Smarmy that we found in our first week, which I, I love this because it's like in their first week, like th- I mean, I love how quickly the twins start like searching for secret passageways because it means that they started finding some without the map. Yeah, no, it, it yeah. absolutely does mean that. And so it means like, yeah, like the, the, these guys were like predetermined. Absolutely, which which also makes me wonder, like, you know, Percy like doesn't look for secret passages right it does make you again wonder it's speaking of charlie and bill if either of them had sort of like found like one or two on their own so that like fred and george would even know to look right yeah like they're going in like oh yeah our eyes are open we're looking for all the secrets right 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 it's like you guys found a couple we'll find all of them it's on um yeah gregory the smarmy i just highlighted and just said trivia that feels like one of those questions that's like in their first year you know who does fred and george say that they where do they find their first secret passage or whatever does harry ever use that one the statue of gregory the smarmy i don't remember a lot of the secret passages are attached to like specific hogwarts like objects or statues or or you know pieces of the scenery in the castle or whatever that they do not stick in my brain at all yeah these are not details that stay with me okay that is that's funny i know that the the one to honey dukes is like in the in the back of the statue of like the one-eyed witch yes the one i I do remember that one yeah Yeah. this was this is like a really cool attention to detail thing earlier this year i was playing through um hogwarts legacy which only got like a third of the way through okay but like i was just you know you're just wandering through the castle and at some point like i looked up on the wall and like there was just this big painting of the um of like trolls in tutus or whatever yes and i was like (gasps) and i turned around and i was like this is where the room of requirement is like it's right here and then i wasn't at that point in the book or in the game yet but like sure enough later on it was like boom this is where it is and it was like so fun to like realize that like this is this is from the book that's right it's got to be this is where it is where it's supposed to be like the attention and then it was was like right on point that's amazing it was that was a very fun discovery no, that's but so anyway. cool. Yep, I love it. I love it. Um, let's see here. So then we finally start to to edge forward to the actual midnight duel. Um, you know, the chapter's namesake here, where Malfoy basically comes over and and once again is just basically like egging Harry on a little bit in a way that it's like he's he's had to cross the whole um, great hall in order to to be a pain. Mm-hmm. Um, you you start to learn like a little bit, I guess, about uh, what like wizards wizard dueling is, but it still feels like sort of it feels to me like this is like the 11 year olds interpretation of 
how it's supposed to go down because like basically Ron basically steps in immediately knowing that Harry basically doesn't know what a wizard's duel is and um, you know Malfoy says like never heard of a wizard's duel before I suppose and Ron's like no of course he has I'm a second who's yours and it's like this idea of having like a second in a duel like this maybe this is a thing for like real world duels you know a la Alexander Hamilton or something I don't yeah I know I'm like trying to figure out what they mean by like a wizard's duel here because like if you're like what is the situation they're in where it's like it is civil enough for there to be rules like there is a second to come in, but it's like a situation where death is on the line and like it feels like if you're du- like I mean, you know, like when they're in like the Battle of Hogwarts, people are dueling all over the place, but those that that feels like wizard du- like dueling in a in a sense of like we're fighting in a in a war. Yes, Not th- what they're describing sounds more like a like an organized event. It, it absolutely you know? does. Yeah, but like it's like like what, t- what are the situations where death is on the line, but you're like, but but we'll have a backup person where the backup person isn't just helping you defeat your like deadly opponent. Well, I think it's like a de- like defending of one's honor type of situation. Yeah, like I think you know like in Game of Thrones or whatever. I think Tyrion. This is where he has. Um, oh goodness gracious! If I hadn't started Jamie. This is it Jamie who well, fights on his behalf? Oh, well, that's I mean who he wants to fight on his behalf, but he ends up having Braun Braun yeah. Braun fights on his behalf. So it's like Tyrion and Braun sort of have this particular relationship where it's like if challenged to a duel, you may have somebody step in in your stead yeah. and and perform on your behalf. And it seems like there's almost like associated like legally binding or socially agreed upon like ramifications based on the the win of the duel. Yeah, like who like based on who wins. It's like, OK, well, uh, you, now it's settled. Now we know. Yeah, Tyrion wins. <laughs> Tyrion wins, but this—I uh, mean, th- even this is different. It's not like they each get a champion, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, I know what you mean. Yeah, it's—it's it's kind of—it's kind of odd and weird. So anyway, yeah, wizards duels apparently. Um, but what we again realize here is that, like, I think it speaks a little bit to, um, you know, Malfoy's sort of like slightly more capableness than you might typically grant him. Um, I mean, like the way he goes down, goes about it here is that he he very intentionally is able to. Um, hook, line, and sinker Ron and Harry in this situation, like effectively get them to go and be out in the castle in the middle of the night where they're not supposed to be and at no point in time has intention of actually going and participating in such duel and on top of that basically is tipping off Filch as to where they're going to be yeah. in the middle of the night. Mm-hmm. So I know that's jumping ahead a little bit on the chapter there, but it's sort of like it's like I mean Malfoy is like being pretty, you know, smarmy himself there didn't we yeah can call it Malfoy the smarmy Malfoy the smarmy yeah I love how when Draco is issuing the duel he says wizards duel wand only no contact and then like one like paragraph later Harry's like what if I wave my wand and nothing happens and Ron says throw it throw it away and punch him (laughs) (laughs) he's like no no you're already having this apparently civil duel of honor the one rule was no contact Ron okay (laughs) Ron's like screw that screw that punch Punch Right in the punch face. him right in the face. He also says, "If he tries to curse you, you better dodge it because I can't remember how to block them." I, I underlined, I can't remember, and said, "As if you ever knew." As if you ever knew. Yeah, no, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I, I do think there's a, a couple of interesting things that happen here. Uh, one of them is that as they stay up super late in order to sneak out in the middle of the night, they go down into the Gryffindor common room where they are um, confronted by one Hermione Granger, who basically has stayed up and is like waiting for them to basically try to dissuade them from doing this particular task. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because this is exactly what Neville does later in the book to Harry, Ron and Hermione. Um, It it absolutely is what Neville does, but I I don't know if I would classify like Hermione and Ron and Harry as friends yet. No. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree. Like I think Hermione's Hermione's reasoning is is very different, but one of the things I do think is really interesting about this is that she then follows him outside of the portrait hole where she then gets stuck because the the fat lady had gone on a nighttime visit Um, and now all of a sudden she's sort of in like a weird situation where she doesn't want to get caught basically sitting outside of the Gryffindor common room, you know, after hours herself. Yeah. So she's like, well, I'm better off just going with you guys. At that point, they end up trotting into Neville, yep. whose arm, of course, had been mended earlier in the day and couldn't it was unable to learn the new Gryffindor common room password, which is pig snout, right? Which, by the way, they're like the second week of school and they've already changed the password. Yeah, which seems like guys, maybe that's too often it's too often. Like, How are you telling the students this stuff? I don't know. It just seems like little meetings. It yeah. seems unnecessarily confusing. But I also what it's confused. This is let's see um, where did I write this down? 
Da, 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 da. Oh, Neville says, thank goodness you found me. I've been out here for hours. I couldn't remember the new password to get into bed, which like uh, how on earth did Harry and Ron not realize Neville wasn't in their dorm? Like there's only five of them. That's true. You know, like, That's they, true. they were up there. Where do they think Neville was? I think it even specifically says like that. They were listening to the sounds of, of Dean and Seamus falling asleep. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, but, the, but they were staying up late and it's sort of like Neville wasn't here, but we weren't concerned about that at all. <laughs> no, no worries at all. Also, I love when her mind is confronting them. She says, I can't believe you're going to do this, Harry. Like End of sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Ron, obviously you do this. Harry, Harry in particular, so I can't believe right, it. Right, right, right. Yeah. No, what, what I find fascinating about this, so we just made a video um, this past week on the Super Carly Mothers YouTube channel where we were talking. Um, what were we talking about? Something to do with Neville. Um, it was a, um, what if Sirius raised Harry? Yes, that's exactly yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, because basically it ends up being the case that Neville and, and Harry end up being a little bit closer and therefore Neville is just like a part of the group and one of the things that we point out inside of that video is that like it's like oh see the devil snare when they're going through and doing all the respective challenges like Hermione does potions Ron does chess Harry does wing keys and it's like we know that Neville's like best subject is herbology so right. it's like on some level we made the point it was like it almost feels like Neville was intended to be the fourth member of this group, right? And like that Dumbledore the, thought he'd go with them or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like on some level, I was like, I, this started to be my, like my new headcanon, especially as I was reading this chapter, because I was like, if anything, it it does seem like it was like there are four challenges that they go through. We know that. This well, there's is, also Fluffy and the troll. There is also Fluffy yeah. and the troll. That's a good yeah. point. Yeah, I always forget about the troll because it's already just not. It's already conscious. knocked out. Yeah, but um, but, but even, Dumbledore is conceivably accounting for that. Yes, because he know he knows Quirrell is the suspicious one. Right, yeah. right. But the fact that what we end up with in the middle of this night for this first particular duel is this group of four people all being out there, sort of like four unusual circumstances. It feels like Neville was supposed to be a bigger part of this trio. Even the fact that like the Marauders were a group of four, four and you know, uh, Harry, Ron, and Hermione sort of each respectively represent, um, you know, like Harry is clearly supposed to be James, uh, Sirius and Ron sort of represent the same role as yeah. sort of like diehard best friend, Hermione and Lupin, uh, you know, sort of are like the, the brains of the operation. And then you've got like, you know, I would never compare Neville to Peter in terms of like, like, right, you know, yeah. character, character or like anything. Nev but Neville outpaces him a right. million strides. But they one. are both sort of that like bumbling boy. A exactly. That maybe are like, yeah. you know, sort of like looking for, for home or friendship like with with the rest of the kids there or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it, I mean, it's just like one of those things where it's like, is it the case that like something happened somewhere along the way and it was like too hard to incorporate a group of four into like the storytelling and so like Neville sort of flits in and out of the frame a little bit based on like yeah. when and how he's needed. But anyway, that was like one of those where I was like, I, I, I think the devil snare is there because I think originally Neville went. Oh, I think that's interesting. That is yeah. interesting. Also, in case you're wondering how the rest of the characters from that uh, era round out, Ginny is supposed to be Lily and Luna is Snape. Luna is Snape, yeah. but again, a much, much, much better Snape. Yeah, um, I mean, Luna, clear. I mean, that's the thing. That's the thing. The The present generation, Harry, Ron, Hermione, Neville, Luna, and Ginny are like the best versions of the characters from the past. Exactly. Uh, other than like Lily and Lily's sort of like a flawless character of the story, so there's not much uh, to really change. Yeah, change. not much to change yeah. about there. Ginny is just cool either way, but like Luna's like a Snape who like Snape is a character. They're both like the outcast characters yeah. basically and it's like they have like the friendship with the the Ginny Lily character archetype yes. going on there, but then um, like J L Snape lets himself be defined by the way that like other people treat him and even though people treat Luna the same way like she doesn't let that define her. Exactly. Anyway. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I think it's the perfect way to yeah. phrase it. So it's it's sort of like one of the the least likely comparable characters. Right. You know, like Luna and Snape, they seem nothing alike, but that is sort of like the way in which they both fall into that original Marauders equation. Mm -hmm. They're waiting for Malfoy to see whether or not like he's going to actually uh, show up and let's see here. I'm trying to try to figure out how to lead myself into this. Uh, there's the curse of the bogeys curse basically. of the bogeys, <laughs> yeah, which I think is sort of like I think the curse of the bogeys is a really ominous way of saying the bat bogey hex. Yeah, which uh, like feels like one of the more common hexes that like largely comes to pass. Like, yeah, it feels like it's sort of in vogue during Harry's time. Yeah, um, so I, I, I never even know what that's supposed to mean. Like is it supposed to make like turn like make bats come out of your nose you or know, is it like are you covered in like 
bat snot. <laughs> it, it always seems like, yeah, they describe it as like like little flapping things all over your skin, which almost makes me think like, I don't know, it's really kind of disgusting to think about, <laughs> um, but it's almost like 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 boogers affixed to your face that right. are then flapping. Right. Is, is sort of like my interpretation of it, which is just okay. Just, the bat boogie hex. Yeah, just kind of horrendous. I, yeah, to think about. I also r- just highlighted where it said uh, the curse of the bogies quarrel told us about and I just like made a little note just said teaching. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Some something did it teach. He did it teach. Amazing. Uh, but from there, yeah, we pretty much see that Malfoy again has has absolutely set them up. Mm-hmm. Um, Filch is once again sort of like d- discovering them and or just simply waiting inside of the trophy room where they're supposed you gotta, to. You gotta um, love that Filch is totally okay with this sense of like entrapment happening here where it's like, oh, you set people up to get in trouble. Great. I'll get them in trouble. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And in no way, shape or form is he just like 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 intending to head it off. It's like like instead of just waiting outside of the Gryffindor common room, he's waiting inside of the trophy room right. to discover them where he knows them to eventually be where it's like a real teacher or like somebody who's trying to like enforce rules here would simply head them off before they ever even had a chance to get this far. Exactly. You know, yeah. it's just it's just like, ridiculous. He, he thrives on the idea of being able to punish them. Yes. Um, hilariously, I know that we've harped on it a lot, so I won't spend too much time on it, but they basically go directly from running into Filch and Mrs. Norris to running into Peeves, which I once again think is just literally no mistake. I think that they're just on opposite ends of the same coin. They are mm-hmm. out in the middle of the castle for the same reason. One is trying to enforce rules. One is trying to cause chaos. Uh, it just again, I think like doubles down on that idea that Filch is just in fact a poltergeist and it just keeps coming up and I yep. feel like it's, it keeps fitting. Yep. Um, uh, but when they do run into Peeves, uh, they say, shut up Peeves, please. You'll get us thrown out. And so just once again, yeah. just like another nod <laughs> like, to this idea. Like of- you, you were out of bed. That's it. You don't get to learn magic ever again, ever. <laughs> Right, right, yeah. right. Yes, yes. As as if that is how it would work. Uh, then they find the door, which is locked and uh, opens to Alohomora, which like, like what a pointless, what a pointless lock. Like there's so many other ways they can lock this door that like Alohomora won't work on it. It's like this is the kind of like thing that makes it feel like Dumbledore wants it to be discovered. <laughs> it's like, e- yes, it, you know, like, like look on some because and that's the thing is that you know, he like, what am I trying to say here? The, the accidental stumbling into this room is just an extremely dangerous thing to simply have happen. So it's like, okay, so it's locked. That means first years can't get into it. But like, basically like as soon as you've learned this spell, it's like, yeah, anyone could get in, but it's like, it's not only a matter of like not wanting someone to be able to get in because they might get hurt by fluffy. It's like making this door itself difficult to get through should just be another layer in guarding the stone. Yes, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I, and that that's like one of those as well, like where you can you can start to inch your way and I won't do too much of it now because I want to save it for later. But the, the Dumbledore's big plan. Oh, yeah, essentially suggests that everything to do with the recovery of the stone is effectively just an obstacle course specifically created for Harry and friends. Yeah, um, but we'll, we'll definitely we'll delve into that really big as we get towards the end of this this book here. Um, but so anyway, Anyway, yeah, so they, they basically successfully escape uh, Peeves. They eventually make it back to the um, oh, well, they, they encounter Fluffy, who is that is like one of those things as well where like Fluffy is just locked inside of this room. Oh, I know for the whole year, the whole year. Ron even says like if any dog needs exercise, that one does. And I was like, no, but for real, that is a real thing. Like, come I, on. Hi- I highlighted that same phrase and literally said not a terrible point. Yeah, yeah like, like that's that's that is just true. <laughs> I know um, poor Fluffy up there. Yep. Yeah. Yep, but then um, so they make it back uh, into the common room by using the password pig snout. Uh, we get the 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 totally infamous line from Hermione who says, I hope you're pleased with yourselves. We all could have been killed or worse expelled. I know I'll highlight that one which is such a such a classic line. And I, uh, I noticed this too is that on just the page before that when they're in the room with Fluffy, it says Harry grope for the doorknob between filch and death. He'd take filch. <laughs> So it's like Harry actually has like the same thought process, but in reverse. Oh, that's you know? hilarious. Like, yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Worse to worse to be um, uh, or better to be expelled than dead. And then Hermione one page later is like, I'd rather you, we could have been expelled. I'd rather have died. It, it's almost yeah. surprising in that case. Yeah, Hermione is not like, nope, we're staying in this room. I'm yeah. not going out there. And <laughs> I know, expelled. Right? Like, <laughs> excuse me. Take my chances with the dog. <laughs> 
Right, right. So anyway, yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're starting to get like the, the foundation a little bit for not only uh, the relationship between, you know, who we affectionately refer to as the golden trio, um, but also sort of this habit they have of sneaking out in the middle of the night, which I do eventually think like pairs up really nicely uh, with the reception of the invisibility cloak, you know, where it's like, oh, now, yeah. like they sort of have to struggle with being out in the middle of the night a little bit and like, like, you know, endure some of the woes about the fact that they're just fully exposed until they can eventually be right. perfectly protected. By it's the unbelievable to me that the four of them managed to successfully sneak out and not get caught without the cloak. And later on, Harry almost can't go three steps with the cloak on without getting caught by Filch. That's a good point. It, yeah. do, it does feel a little bit like maybe some of some of Harry's like use of the cloak in the middle of the night. It's like nobody's out in the middle of the night. Like the corridors right. are all empty. You I can know just simply like, you know, not that you wouldn't have to be careful, but if you were if you were listening or if it, you know, Filch was required to like carry a torch, you know, it's like in, in that particular instance, just just look around each corner hard. before you right. go out. Yeah, exactly. Like and the other thing is that like if this is another thing that points to Filch being a poltergeist is that he is apparently just out in the castle every night, but he's also working in the castle all day. Yeah, it's like it doesn't seem like he needs to sleep like why there's no reason like at like I guarantee you at boarding schools. There's not people just patrolling the halls at night making sure students are in their bed. Yeah, you just trust the students to stay in bed, right? I mean, it would seem like it would it would seem like such a um, such a a large amount of effort for something that I think most nights would not end up being a problem. Yeah. Well, especially there's the other thing, especially for the Gryffindor. I realize it's like they get back and they're like pigs now pigs now and the fat lady's back and she lets them in. It's like the fat lady is like for the Gryffindors should just be the 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 reason none of you ever go out like literally every day McGonagall must go to the Gryffindor common room at some point and she could just be like anyone get out of bed last night. Oh, I, yeah, you know, I, I, I wrote that down actually because I was I was curious about the exact same thing. I was like, is it possible that the fat lady is not able to report students um, because I mean even like when we go when we fast forward to uh, like a reminiscence from Molly and Arthur. We know that like one night in particular, they were out past like four 30 in the morning or something like that. Um, and it's like, it, it does seem like the fat lady would just be like a really, really, really good security system just to simply be like, yeah, this scare this, this person was out in the middle of the night, like, right? Like and, anytime anyone cause she can visit the other frames. Like as soon as students get out, she could just be like, well, I'm going to have to go wake up Minerva or Dumbledore or whoever. But I wonder, maybe this is like one of those things too, where it's like, I think at the end of the day, like Dumbledore doesn't really mind a little rule breaking. Oh, that, that this is, it reminds me of Ender's game where like he like uh, when he gets to the school and Ender is like, they wouldn't have made these so easy to hack if they didn't expect us to do it. That's true. You know, yeah, and it's yeah, like yeah. it feels like there's a little like, I always feel like Dumbledore has this like that sort of whimsy about him with rule breaking where he's like, of course we have rules, but like wink wink, you know, <laughs> well, I mean, that's the thing. Yeah, like eventually even with the the mirror of era said like Dumbledore clearly is like giving Harry the cloak with the knowledge that Harry's going to leave the dormitory and go exploring and he's basically waiting for him yeah. where he expects him to ultimately right. you know be in a castle that you could otherwise easily get lost in so it's like Dumbledore is pretty sure about like how how certain things are going to go the other thing too I guess that you could keep in mind is it's hard to know how long uh, the Gryffindor common room has used the fat lady portrait as its its mechanism for entry but if it's been up there since the beginning and it's a millennium old it's like it's possible that like literally she's just witnessed so many kids be out in the middle of the night that like she just doesn't think that much of it anymore really? it's like whatever it's like like for 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 the past 1000 years kids have been sneaking out in the middle of the night. right. Yeah, so it's like I'm just gotta let the kids be kids man. Exactly. Exactly. So <laughs> well, speaking I, of which the uh, chapter art for this particular chapter, the midnight duel features the fat lady. Yes, it sure does. Yeah, you get you get a, a, an interesting look here and it's funny because like the they, they talk often about climbing through the portrait hole and I think it, in particular at one point um, Ginny is frustrated that Dean is like helping her through the portrait hole. Yeah, and she's like, you're always doing that, Dean. Like, yeah, you know, you're, you're always helping me through the hole. And this is like, it's funny because and maybe it's because I was influenced partially by this particular photo just in, in the first book. But 
I never think of the portrait hole as like something you would need help to get through. Yeah. I, I always just sort of think of it as like a big painting hanging on the wall and there's just like a threshold like any other door would have like. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the door doesn't extend all the way to the ground. Like there is a certain amount of like stepping through it. That's I've always true. imagined this one. The the one in the book makes it look like really big. Like you do have to step over it, but uh, I think it, like in my mind, I've always imagined it like a big oval or something, which seems like it would be such a such a hassle in the morning if lots of students are all exiting the common room at the same time. Like, hold on, we all got to climb through. <laughs> that does, yeah. It seems like that would be incredibly cumbersome to, yeah. to kind of like like weasel your way through this this like unusual position every time. You're right, though. Maybe, maybe I have pictured an oval in my head, and it's like, how big does the oval have to be in order to have a proper shaped rectangle behind it? Yeah, I mean, it's not the portrait door; it's the portrait hole. The portrait you know? hole. Yeah. I've never described a hole. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, you see a square hole a square know? hole square hole actually for a period of time also it, like before we really got going with super Carlin brothers. I was our mom works for the local SPCA yeah, and I was digging the graves for the pet cemetery. Oh, what a fun job as like a spare. Yeah, like a, like a, my like my side hustle or whatever, <laughs> which one digging holes the hardest exercise known to man and very difficult, but oddly I do think of holes sometimes as square simply oh. because I was digging <laughs> graves All right. well. and they were square, but that was a total aside and mostly just an opportunity to talk about this really weird and eclectic job I once did um, anyway. So what do you think of the chapter art? You like this one? I like this one. Yeah, I think it's so funny that it shows Harry and Ron like in their pajamas and even in their like um, in in the chapter. It says like they put on their bathrobes and I was like guys. What you're going to what you think is a duel. Why aren't you wearing better clothes? Yeah, <laughs> what are you doing? Why are you going to be out there dueling Malfoy in, in your bathroom? In your bathroom. <laughs> I know, that, that does feel like one of those things like where I can imagine Malfoy showing up actually and being like, he's wearing bathrobes yeah. <laughs> like Potter. It, it feels like the type of thing Malfoy would never let Harry live down. Yeah, yeah, yeah so that would anyway. be it. Yeah, he's just there with the camera. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Gotcha <laughs> journalism at its best. Yep. Okay. Do you have a review for us for today? Well, 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 I can give you a quick review from uh, over on Apple podcasts here. Yes, this one comes from Rachel C who says such a great conversation. I listened to all the available episodes one through five and then had to get my husband involved. So we were starting from the beginning and getting caught up. We listen to the books every night to go to sleep and the question we have are similar to the ones that the Carlin brothers bring up. I love the, their conversation and we still have um, we can still have over the books. My husband wants to know if squibs can use magical objects or not. If you could help him out. Ooh, that's interesting. Like, so they could use like a port key like could, oh yeah, like could they use a port key like I'm like thinking like the deluminator or something. It seems like I don't see any reason that wouldn't work. You know, that's true. That it seems like you just click it. it would it be like no, you're not magic. It's just a lighter to you. This, this, yeah. yeah, like this. This literally just does the function you expect it to. Yeah. Um, that feels like the type of thing like a, like a magical inventor may incorporate into kind of like Newt's Commander's case, like where he have the yeah. ability to like magicify it or not. You know, on the yeah. basis of. But that's something he's manually doing, not just like yeah. if you open it, it's like. You know, to anybody but else, it just this looks is a like good question because it's like could like a could like a could a squib go into the pensive. You know, something like that. I, I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think if there's could like anyone any... could a muggle, <laughs> right? That's the question. Yeah, yeah. it's like I, I'm trying. I'm trying to get like a baseline for anything that we see that could potentially be unusual. Okay, what's coming to mind is ghosts for me, where muggles can't become ghosts. Only wizards can become ghosts. Okay, but so could a squib become a ghost? This is a tricky one. That is a tricky one. Hmm. I, I mean, again, I think we have a very, very, very small example to go off of, but I do think Jacob uses a port key in the Fantastic Beast movies when they go on the bucket. You're right. Um, You're right. And so if, to that end, yes. Uh, yeah. So I think I think that that would be that's the only nearly canon explanation that we would have as to how or when or why. Um, like anybody who's non magical because I, I, I largely think that when it comes down to it, a squib is sort of like a derogatory term that is otherwise just being used towards what are effectively just like witch and wizard born muggles, right? But there is like some I think the 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 problem comes when 
Mrs. Fig is defending Harry in court. And it's the and question of whether or not. Yeah, she whether can squibs see. can see the Dementors because muggles can't see Dementors, but wizards can. But she's a squib and she says she can and they don't know. Yeah, even I think fudge in that situation is like, can they? And like this is like one of those situations where you can't tell because like Mrs. Fig seems better than we've ever really known her to be in the past. Um, like in terms of like she, she even says like, you know, I, I had to kind of make it uncomfortable for you for all those years because otherwise the Dursleys, you know, if they thought you were having a good time, they wouldn't have let you come over. Yeah. So you're like almost wondering like to what links was Mrs. Fig being like, man, I'm really gonna have to like, like find ways to make this uncomfortable. Yeah. Or is Mrs. Fig still just sort of like a, like, you know, your, your stereotypical like cat lady who, you know, lives, you know, in solitude yeah. and, and Although- maybe even to that end, like uh, this is like some extracurricular reading on like Pottermore, but like Mrs. Fig is not just it's not cats. They're measles that, that is she's true. reading. So she's still like interacting with the magical world. That's a good point in some capacity. Yeah, right. And yeah, that's a good point. It's a good point. And the, the other one, too, is that like if you're a muggle, you're not supposed to be able to see the castle and, and to backtrack on our own theory about Filch, who otherwise we believe to be a squib right. based on the writing. Yeah, not um, that's not that's not necessarily canon. But so like I, I, with within the story, he's a presumably just a squib yes. who works at the school, but he can see the school because he works there. Right, right, right. Yeah, so that that must mean on some level. I feel but, like, oh, but then Jacob goes inside the school too. That's also true. Yeah, that's also true. Yeah. yeah. So it's like maybe once you like like from afar, it would look like moldering old ruins, but like once you actually went inside, it would just look like it's supposed to. Maybe that's like I, that's that's like one of those things where it does feel like there's a big disillusionment charm over the whole castle, but it's like a disillusionment charm is just simply so that you don't keep investigating. It's just sort of be like, well, there's no reason to go over there. Um, which, you know, if you know anything about actual human muggles, we would absolutely investigate ruins to the nth degree. Yeah, um, right. So it's like, it's like if that. I don't think that would really dissuade most muggles, but either way. Um, but that would suggest that, like, if you were to cross through the barrier, then of, of the disillusionment charm, then what you would see is just what's actually there. I think, I think muggles could use magical objects. I think the port key is a great example. Like, the port key exists and they use it. And I feel like if Jacob was holding the invisibility cloak, he could use it. Right. You know, he also if he drinks the giggle water, it does cause him to giggle, which right. sounds like not that magical, but I'm assuming that giggle water is a magically infused um, yeah, beverage like beverage. Yeah, you know, so it's like on some level like it is it is doing the thing that it is supposed to be able to accomplish because there's no otherwise there's no like liquid you could drink now that would like you would take a sip and make you laugh, right? Um, so, okay, okay, I think squibs. I mean, kid. Jacob goes in Newt's case, you know, that's true. Yeah, that's true. I think I think squibs could interact with magical objects. Yeah. Okay. I think so. Yeah. I think I think that you couldn't channel your magic through anything, but that doesn't mean that a magical object wouldn't still do what it magically does of its own accord. Right. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Because even if you go to like Fred and George's um, disappearing head hats, yeah. like the like Hermione comments that the spell inside of the hat must be like particularly like skillful. Yeah. Um, oh, but this is also just. Arthur's whole job is just the misuse of muggle artifacts and it's just like muggles getting you know in accidents with magically enchanted objects. So that's also true. I mean, they don't know how to use them correctly, but they interact with them plenty. That's true. Yeah, that's true. So yes, yes to answer your question, Uh, but it wasn't obvious. Yeah, it took some. It took some. We we got there. Yeah, we got there in the end. So anyway, but yeah, if you guys have any reviews for us, it certainly does help the show out a lot. If you'd be happy to go and leave us a five star, uh, you may also get the opportunity to hear your review read here uh, on the podcast. Oh, and leave us a question. That was fun. The questions are fun. Yeah. Yeah, we also have a spreadsheet down below, which I feel like we have not interacted with in the way that we want to at all. Uh, not a spreadsheet, but a, a, a Google form where if you have a question about a specific chapter, especially if it's one that is upcoming, uh, you can submit your question through there. And that is actually something we can try to incorporate into future episodes of the show. Yeah. So that's a great way to sort of, you know, get involved a little bit in the conversation. And uh, maybe if there's something that Jay and I don't happen to catch inside of the chapter, which I have to say, it blows my mind how often me and you have highlighted the same. Oh, I know like, the things that phrases. like stand out to us. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that possibly is due 
due to the fact that you and I look at the story through the same lens so frequently. Anyway. Yeah. Um, but if there's anything we haven't touched on, anything that you know is upcoming that you want to make sure that we do discuss, uh, be sure to check out that Google form down below and submit it. Uh, we would absolutely appreciate it. But I think that's all for today. Yeah. Otherwise, we'll see you next time through the Gryffindor.